Okay. Test, test. We should be streaming live now, and I'll turn it over to you, Madam President. Okay, good evening. Welcome to the Parks and Recreation Commission meeting for Wednesday, March 14th, 2018, starting at 5.35 p.m. Could we please have roll call Steve? Yes. Uh, Joe Greer. Present. Jessica West. Present. Keith Bevan is absent. Uh, Michelle Jensen. Present. Kayla McNay is currently absent. Uh, John Nesmith. Present. <laughs> Mike Pepin. Present. Uh, Craig Steele is uh, <coughs> coming, uh, should be here in the next 20 minutes or so. And Hannah Stewart Sturdivant. Present. All right. Thank you. So next we have the adoption of the agenda. Can I get a motion to adopt the agenda? Jessica West makes a motion to adopt. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. And then we have announcements with Shelley Houston. Good evening, commissioners, councilmen, other distinguished guests. <clears throat> I know this looks the same every time, the handout I give you with the calendar of upcoming events, but I promise you I, I pluck off those that have passed and then start populating it with some additional items. So I won't bore you to death and read it to you verbatim, but we, we would remind you of a couple that are maybe highlights. Um, first and foremost, tomorrow is our dedication ceremony for the Journey of Heroes art installation in Heroes Park. And the sun will be shining and the birds will be singing when we convene at 4 p.m. under tents, just in case they're not. So anyway, we'll have some light refreshments. And really, we expect the program to last maybe 25 to 30 minutes. And then you're welcome to stick around for cookies and, and water, because we're fancy like that. Or if you need to head off to another obligation, that's fine too. So uh, we think Kristen Armstrong, the gold medal cyclist, will be with us along with several other hero representatives from the community as well. So if you can join us, we would love to have you. The lovely Joe Greer will be rehearsing all night the, the words to the Pledge of Allegiance. Good luck with that. Um, and as we go into April, we have the ribbon cutting for that pathway segment H2 over off Fairview Avenue. And then you'll remember that's immediately followed by our commission bike tour. This is the one that I need you to let us know as soon as possible if you don't have access to a, a good dependable bicycle to use and a helmet for your noggin, because we want to set a good example. If you need help with bicycle or helmet, be sure to let us know and we can see if we can't wrangle something up with you. Um, and we're not really planning to serve a meal on that at that time, so you could either gorge it on cookies or cake at the <laughs> ribbon cutting, or maybe bring along some protein bars or snackies or granola bars or whatever you need to get you through until your dinner time. We don't think it'll last too darn long. So anyway, you might lose a pound or two. That would be a bonus. Um, the other things you know about, I would point out a new one on April 6th. It's a Friday at noon hour. We're doing a vol volunteer appreciation luncheon. That's Volunteer Appreciation Month. And so Mayor Tammy wants to honor all the city volunteers people that serve on boards and commissions and committees, as well as those that volunteer in the parks or here at the front desk or at the police station or on other, other assignments. So we'd like to have you, and we want you to RSVP to Morgan Andrus up in the mayor's office if you're going to swing by for um, lunch and a few attaboys and attagirls. Um, yeah, we'll also be having an orientation meeting for park uh, potential park ambassadors that want to join the park patrol. That's going to be on April 26th from 9.30 to noon here at City Hall. Anyone that might be interested in that opportunity can talk to Barb Hatch in advance, and she can kind of pre-screen them, let them know what to expect. And if it sounds like it, they're very interested or might be a good fit, they'd want to attend that orientation. Um, I don't think I'm going to get into the rest. It's, it's all things we've talked about before. Any questions, comments, worries, other, other excitement or enthusiasm? No? Okay. 
My work here is done. Madam President, I actually have one other event to let you know about. I was just looking up the email because I just uh, found out about it yesterday. But there is a bike share program that's actually coming through the, uh, as a recommendation to council through the Transportation Commission. Um, and they're going to be presenting to the council on March 27th. I do, so as a heads up, I do believe that each of you will be getting an, uh, an email from the planning department because um, they will be demoing their, um, their bikes and things out in front of City Hall prior to the council meeting that night, and they wanted to invite the, the Parks Commission as well. Um, if there is interest uh, from the council in moving forward, I do anticipate that we would have a presentation from them to this commission uh, because there uh, would likely be some interface between that bike share program and our parks as likely places that uh, bikes might get parked for that program, things like that. So more to come uh, on that at a later date, but I just wanted to give you a heads up that you may be receiving an invitation through the planning department to come and check out their uh, bikes and things if you're interested that night. And we'll look forward to a future presentation to the commission on that topic. Also, I recall receiving an email that had a link for that park naming that we had yes. talked about. So the, uh, the park naming uh, is underway. It launched at the beginning of the month. Um, I checked yesterday, and we had 200 responses, just under 200 responses so far. Um, all the names were fairly evenly matched. Uh, uh, and so all were definitely still in the running. Um, it will remain open really for the next uh, six weeks until the end of next month. Uh, their plan was to have the current uh, uh, survey monkey survey open until the end of this month, and then they would create a new, R new URL so that they could put it out through the, uh, the water sewer uh, bills that go out as a newsletter and kind of track that response as well. So uh, still open for, you know, we're like two weeks into it, six weeks to go, um, 200 responses so far, and pretty evenly matched at this point. Yeah. Madam President? Yes. Steve? Yes. Like anything new that's like the other comment, you know, like anything that's been interesting that not necessarily funny, but any good ideas as far as names are concerned that aren't part of the four that were offered? Uh, there's a variety of responses in that. Uh, certain people have, you know, uh, you know uh, ideas for people that they could be named after. Um, the one that stood out to me was Inspiration Park, was a, a name that uh, uh, was thrown in there. But they're 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 kind of all over the bar board. There's no theme growing out of out of out of the other list at this point. Okay, thank you. Um, next would be old business, which we have Mike Barton. The Banshell Shade Update. Thank you. So um, last summer we brought um, bought to you a, um, a couple of different concepts to add shade to the front of the band shell at Kleiner Park. Um, the current band shell that's seen here is facing west. So in the, in the summertime, at a, starting at about two or three o'clock, it's brutally hot in there. Um, we've done a little bit of work on the hillside. We planted t about 25 um, larger sized trees that are doing really well. Um, I think they were they were probably 20 feet when they went in, and they put on about three or four feet of growth last year. So they're actually filling in to where the spectators can have a nice, comfortable place to sit. So the next thing that we wanted to work on was how do how do we keep the performers cool and um, you know just I mean it's just brutally hot. So um, from the discussions last summer, we came up with a um, a concept to add these sails to the front of the band shell. And um, there's, there would be four posts in the, along the front, and then, all, and then these two um, 
these two cloth pieces that overlap would connect to one common post towards the back of the, the band shell. If you look at the very back where that wall is, <clears throat> there's a space behind that where performers can come out. And if you had to do a costume change or something, you can get in there. So it wouldn't interfere with that. Um, so we've been working on this concept to make sure that you know, just from a constructability point of view that it would work, it would, it would cast enough shadow on there that we could actually build it um, and that it wouldn't interfere with sight lines from the hill. So as you're, if you're sitting on the top of the hill, there's kind of a fine balance there between, um, you know, we wanted as low as possible, but then we didn't want to block the view from anybody sitting towards the top of the hill. Um, that's just another another view that gives you a little different perspective. Um, so we so we think we have it pretty well worked out. Um, you know, aside from the the colors wouldn't be maybe that necessarily. We'd probably go with some earth tones or something, but that kind of pops. Um, here is a a view from up on top of the the berm, and it gives you an idea from two o'clock on how that how that how the shadows would work their way across the performers at the front of the stage you can kind of see and then some of the trees at the on the berm start to take over at six seven o'clock so there's a there's a pretty good period of shade there I'll run it through again and just so you can check it out How many does, year is this done? This this was um, that's a great question. Yeah, thank you. Um, July tenth, fifteenth, okay, something like you know, that. Angularity of the sun does make a difference. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, we wanted to get worst case, and that's about as bad as it gets right there. Um, so we had that, and then what we did is we um, we we brought this forward to one of our recreational recreation suppliers that has built a lot of picnic shelters for us and playgrounds and we asked them to price it out and um, what they came back with is a version of that they came back instead of the two overlapping pieces of fabric they came back with three triangles so you can kind of see that's a um, just in plan view and then that's what it would look like where it's colored up you can see they still have the same four posts in the, out in the front, connected to a common post in the back. But these are three independent shade cloths. And one of the reasons that they went with that or, is that they said the, those cloths would weigh about 350 pounds each. So the concern was just, <laughs> you know, having people go up in a lift and connect them and how to unroll it and actually physically get them up there and, and remove them because what we'd want to do is we'd want to put them up about June 1st and remove them in September because there's times of, times of the year you want to be in the sun. I mean, if you were doing something out there now or in April, you want the sun. So we don't want that up. And it just protects it and gives it a little bit longer lifespan. So, I mean, we can do it, but... Um, personally, I don't think it's as attractive, but I think it would, you know, for the guys that have to put it up, it might function better. So um, that's the presentation, and I think the ask is, are we on the right track with the, with the shade cloth there? Are we down to just colors that might blend in with the park? We do have some budget money left over from other Kleiner projects um, that would fund about so this, this price, we had it priced out. This came back at $104,000 installed. And that's without bonds yeah. and insurance and contingency. So to request a budget to do this, um, you know, it's in the, we would need a, a budget. We don't know what's gonna happen with steel prices and construction next, you know, next winter. We're talking about a year from now or putting it in. So um, realistically, a budget 
a reasonable budget for this would be one hundred and thirty to one hundred and forty thousand dollars. We may not spend it all, but just as a budget number, we have so we have fifty towards that, um, and so we want to find out from you: is it is this a good is it a good idea? Is it a worthwhile project? Um, we'd like to do a budget enhancement to um, fund the difference, so it would be. A, probably a $90,000, $85,000, enhancement to our budget. Um, so with that, I'll stand for questions and appreciate any feedback you have. So Mike, I have a question. Um, what is the life expectancy of the fabric? It, I have an idea. Yeah, great question. Um, it's, it depends on how many months it's left up. Um, and if we leave it up June, July, and August, we can get 15 years out of it. And then are the posts, are those powder coated? They are. Painted? Okay. Yep, powder coated. And one of the reasons that it is so expensive is that the footings that you need to put underneath these things are gigantic. The piers are huge, yeah. They are not just a bolt down thing that you'd see at a restaurant. They have to go um, under, the core under of the one earth. of those posts. It's about a... A six by six by six footing with steel cages and grounding rods and um, it's built to withstand 120 mile an hour wind load which is not it, it doesn't it's it's hard to for us to design to that and we've had this ongoing conversation that if it's if we have a 70 mile an hour wind nobody's in the park and the fabric's likely torn off so why do we need the poles to withstand 120 miles an hour but that's what the that's what the building code says, so that's what we need to follow. Um, the other thing that's a little bit costly is the fact that it's just, we're going down through existing concrete, so you gotta, you gotta cut out you know, big sections and hope that you don't can't, uh, cantilever or um, undermine the, the next slab and, and it makes guys nervous. And then also the back pole, they have to work up inside the band shell. So there's really no good access in there for any kind of big equipment. So it's a lot of handwork and um, so just some of the factors. Madam President. Yes. So Mike, <clears throat> with the different design, what does it do to the, the shadow study given that you have gaps within, because you have the three triangles instead of the overlapping, how does that affect the, right. the shadow play in July and August? Yeah, yeah good, good questions. Um, so we didn't, this, the shadow study came from the, uh, the architect that we had work on the concept. So these, um, these people I don't think have that capability. We could look at that. I don't think that it would change much because it's still, the cloth is still the same um, distance out over the steps forward and it's the same height. So there may be some gaps that you see in there so you can see where the sun might cut through. I don't know if that's a deal killer because you could maybe move around and, and hide from it, but I would expect that it would be relatively close to the, the one we did on the other one. Madam President? Yes. Mike, if the goal is to provide the best amount of shade in this Second rendering is more of a weight allowance for ease of putting up and down. Mm -hmm. You'd really have to consider what the experts say on what's going to provide the most shade, regardless of the weight of the fabric. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I've been, uh, I, 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 I agree. Um, and I've been kind of thinking in my mind how exactly are we going to get you know, if it weighs 350 pounds and you hook a side and then you, so there's a couple of lifts, man lifts that would be come into play. It's not a, yeah, so I, I know we can do it. Um, that was just a, it was a comment that this um, um, superior shade made and I don't know if it was, it was generated from the fact that they don't, they don't sell the other style or they just wanted to sell this. I, I don't know. But it yeah. seemed like a legitimate. Yeah, it's like. Well, oh, I don't, okay, I don't great, disagree with the second at all. I just think of what the primary purpose is, and um, your team or uh, 
a local team can figure out how to get up the best shade. I think this is the best design. Yeah. I, really I would do. agree. Madam President. Mm -hmm. um, I guess feedback on whether or not we need it or not and do a budget enhancement, I would say absolutely, because we have a venue that at least a couple months out of the year is unusable because of the heat, and that happens to be when the most optimal time to use it is. And my other opinion is I think you need to do what it takes to do that design because not only aesthetically it's a lot more pleasing, it does provide a lot more shade. And I think you need to figure out how to put it up. Okay. Yep. Madam President. Mm -hmm. Mike, can you go back to that uh, graphic, to that video? Because it looked like the stage was still unshaded for several hours of the day. Lose it when it goes down just a little bit. Yeah. The sun sets. Yeah. Lose a little bit. The sun sets. But it just it just looked like Yeah, let me see. Let me try the to performers are at, uh, out of shade. So for right like about there at five o'clock. Yeah, it just looks like they don't have any shade from four to seven o'clock. And isn't is that the most brittle time or is it around two or three o'clock? Um no, five o'clock's brutal. I think what what we need to do is um, there's there's a balance, like I said, that the height. I'm not sure the height of this is would really <clears throat> it reflects what we would actually propose. In that, we need to go to the top of the hill and say, okay, at 10 feet or 11 feet, you can still see the stage. That's where it needs to go. I mean, because, you know, and even sitting down at the top of the hill or close to the top, um, because we don't make, want to make it too high because we compromise shade. We don't want to make it too low because we compromise views. I would just say that we would go out there and, you know, the, it's still a little bit of a work in progress, but we would confirm those things. Madam President, Mike. So if we do have questions about the shade and what's a better canopy, have we talked to a company that specializes in shade, like Shadeworks? And I see their flyers all the time. That's why they come to mind. But yeah. And just ask them to propose something to us? Yeah. Um, so so this was done by Johnson Architects. Um, okay. And what I would, what I think the approach I would take um, is to take this and put it out to bid to multiple multiple companies. I mean, the one bid that we got and the, the return design, this, we just wanted to get a price to see if we were in the ballpark with our existing budget or how much budget we <coughs> needed just to get some, <coughs> excuse me, some planning level numbers. Um, so, so we're not. Coverworks doesn't do this stuff. I know they don't, they do backyard awnings and stuff so we're not with that the different options and I don't remember the difference in all of them but some of them you go you put it out to bid and it's special to exactly what you want and you're just asking people to price it and then the other way right. you say we have this much money you show me how you do it best yeah, is that a no, request I've... for proposal is that kind of what we would be doing then with this so it doesn't matter what design we necessarily pick today I would we put would this design I would put this design out to bid and get prices on this design, because I would be, I, I mean, the other way, you're not sure what's gonna come back. But then you right. still grade it, though. No, I know. That would be a design build, where I think we have a good design, I would rather just bid it, I think. Mm -hmm. Unless, I mean, we're here to talk about it, so. Madam President? Personally, I think I would just bid it. Well, and, and my comment, Mike, would be, I think, Yes, I would definitely agree with putting this out to bid because I, I like this design quite a bit. But it might be really interesting to see what a shade company do this as a, tell us what this would cost us, but if you have a really great idea, what would that look like? Oh. Because they may have had some experience in doing something similar that would provide would provide us the ability to provide shade at a weight that is supportable by staff that, mm -hmm. so you, you could okay. potentially try and go at it both ways. Madam President. Mm -hmm. 
There may be a material there that could be lighter than 350 pounds okay. too. It's possible. You know. Yeah, and and I don't, I don't know what. <clears throat> I mean, it's hard to make a blanket statement that these are too heavy because you don't. We didn't we didn't give them any parameters on the material, so it could be really th heavy, thick canvas that's going to last 30 years, or it could have been lightweight stuff. We don't know. I mean, it was just. Yeah. There's, there's some details to work out for sure. Um, but I think what I'm hearing is yeah, this, you know, it, it's a worth it, worthwhile project. Um, pursue the, the overlapping fabric. Um, re request a budget to fund it. And when we get down to bidding it, request um, prices on this or equal or alternate designs to this. So maybe we could save some money. Mm -hmm. Does that kind of capture yes. what Value your thoughts engineer are? engineer, design. Madam President, my, my thoughts are just that maybe there are companies that build, that specialize in shade. So going to them and just asking what they think would be best, you know, might just completely blow us away and yeah. they might have some better idea. But I, personally, I like the original design that you guys had over the second version as well with the three different entities. Okay. Madam President, if I, I could just interject. Both designs came through shade companies. This one did come from Lindgren Arch or, uh, Architects, but the or Johnson Architects with Walt Lindgren. But he was he had engaged a shade company in coming up with it. And then the, the design with the three was from sending it out to a shade company and saying, please give us a bid, and they sent back that design themselves. So um, two shade companies have been involved so far, and there may be others. Yes. So maybe you could, I'm um, sorry, you maybe could ask for a bid and then a bid alternate, and the alternate would be um, a variation of the design if they have a better concept. Sure. But I agree that this design doesn't have gaps. Um, my only concern is that it does overlap, so you do have some wasted material, so that's where, um, but it looks nicer. So that's probably why they came back with a three-piece, because you can use less material, maybe. So for just for a point of reference, the material cost for the, the steel and the fabric is about $30,000, $35,000. Oh, okay. So that's mostly. The, so the whole scheme, grand scheme of things, it's, it's the installation and the footings that just that really drive the water. price up. So I, the overlap, yeah, I appreciate that, that there's some waste there, but, um, you know, maybe the back pole needs or the poles need a little bit. You, you might have to go to a bigger diameter pole mm -hmm. because there's more wind loading because there's those are bigger panels. We haven't flushed that out yet. Just a thought. I, I'm guessing that the visual interest created by the overlap would probably be worth the. I, I think if you got rid of that, the decrease would be almost. It would be nominal. It'd be small. A wash is so not much of the overall cost is in that additional it's fabric. The there was some. Yeah. yeah I think not much. The gaps that aren't shaded is a big deal. Yeah, the gaps are a big deal. I agree. Yeah. It's a big deal. Yeah, it is. Those little gaps that give you sunburn. Well, um, thank you. I just want to say I didn't realize that that was already designed, that the construction companies yeah. um, sent that out or had experts help them, but it makes sense, and thank you for that. Any more comments? Sounds like everybody is on board with moving forward for bidding the original design, but entertaining. But budget request first. Oh, yes, budget request yeah. first. Excuse me. A budget thing. That, that, <laughs> that little budget yeah. issue. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And I do think that was the important part is knowing that we do have a ballpark budget finally. Yeah. Is the bang worth the buck? Because it is expensive. So we're like, is it? And what, what we're hearing is yes, move forward, create a budget enhancement, take it to council. Just for reference, so I have um, managed some projects where we um, installed a pavilion, which is a preset package, 
and those roughly run about $60,000, and then with installation and all of the um, site improvements, you're still up in the 120 area, and those are 20 by, I wanna say 20 by 60, 20 by 40, somewhere in that ballpark, so it's not too far off. Okay, now we have Clenner Park Memorial Plaza fee updates with Steve. Madam President, members of the commission, just wanted to give you a quick update on the, the fees. Uh, you made a recommendation to the council. Um, we presented to the council, and I think I gave a brief update, but the, uh, the public hearing for the fees is next week. So, uh, the, so we have a current memorial program at Tully Park. This is a bit of an overview to, for those that maybe weren't here uh, when we started talking about this last year. Um, so we have a memorial tree lane along the Bud Porter pathway. Um, it involves 12 by six granite plaques. The cost of them is $290. And that program is full. Every tree in the park has a, has a plaque by it and it's done. The discussion go, coming out of that was, let's not keep, uh, continue placing uh, what amount to the, the look of a headstone by every tree in, in every park. Let's, uh, uh, well, you all know that we've moved toward, uh, MIAC proposed a, a plaza in Kleiner Park, and, and that's where we're headed. But I'll, we also have the, another existing program, just to make sure everyone's aware of it. Here in Generations Plaza, there's these walls that have brass plaques on them. Um, those brass plaques are still available at, at the cost of $100. They're four inches by two inches, uh, mounted on brick, and, and that's still uh, available. The, the program's a little over, the, the walls are a little over half full. Uh, the most visible walls are the, the full ones, but there are you know, backsides and, and, and other ones if there's interest there. Fast forward to the program that we've been talking about for the fees. And that is uh, the new memorial program with the Mayor's Youth Advisory Council in Kleiner Park. Um, it's a memorial plaza with pavers. I don't need to read all the dimensions to you. I think you're fairly familiar with it. We did the presentation to you just a couple of months ago where we were selecting the tree. And that's the Magnolia Butterflies tree that you see at the bottom. Uh, since the picture on the top was taken, uh, the, the pavers have been installed. And I think Elroy... Uh, was a big part of that, so some kudos to, to Elroy for leading that effort. And uh, uh, we, the, what, what's remaining is the planting of the tree, the installation of the benches on the sides, and then the, uh, the, the plants and shrubs around the, the outside. Okay, moving on to um, the cost. This is what we talked about in quite a bit of detail, I think back in November, December-ish with the Commission, we were trying to come up with what's what's the right cost here. So we we detailed all of our all of our costs, um, and that two hundred and fifty dollars would cover all the co the cost of the brick, the engraving, the mobilization, and staff time um, at a cost of two hundred and fifty bucks. You can see the big cost in there is the mobilization, and that's important to note because I'm going to come back to that here in a little bit. But what was recommended at uh, that time from the commission was let's go with that 250 base cost for a 4x8 and 400 for an 8x8 uh, so a little less than uh, $100 less than double and he also talked about a promotional period um, we took we took this to council had further discussion uh, and the first question was what do other memorial programs charge so the city of Boise has the Idaho Fallen Firefighters bricks. Those bricks cost between $100 and, and, and $200. Um, also, the Veterans Memorial Park Patriot Walk bricks, a 4x8, same size that we have, are $100, and the 8x8s are, are $200. They also do have 12x12s, which we don't have, but they didn't list a price for those on their, on their website. 
Um, the discussion that ensued was about what if we, right now our proposed costs have everybody paying the full cost for mobilization one at a time. And what if we were to aggregate them to get that cost down a little bit? Um, and if we were to say we had at least four, you know, if we did it twice a year, which I think we did, we did talk about uh, when we uh, met, and we were tr trying to do this in May, kind of before Memorial Day, and again in October before Veterans Day comes in November, um, and we had two dates that were set about six months apart, and everything that came in during that six months was then uh, engraved at once. And if you assume that we would have at least four come in and those could be split, you can get that cost down to 145, and then if you round that to 150, these numbers of 150 and 250 kind of match the, the promotional pricing that the commission was already recommending. The, uh, I think the council liked the idea of this range being more in line with what other memorials are, and let's just make that pricing the standard pricing. But then if somebody has a special need and they don't want to wait until May, they don't want to wait until October, they can pay the extra $100 and mobilize for their own. So the fees that are being, I think I have it on this next slide. Uh, no, I'm going to stay back here. So the fees that are being noticed, they're out for notice right now, is that a 4x8 will be 150 an 8x8 will be 250 and that um, if you don't want to work, you know, have it installed on our schedule but your own, then you, they would be 250 and 350 um, Let me pause there and ask if there are any questions. Does that all make sense? So... Um, the other kind of things we've been talking about are related to the, the, the policy. So the, the first and, pr and probably main point is that we would uh, propose installation twice per year, uh, approximately May and October is what we would target. We're we, I say approximately because, uh, you know, if we can control it, May and October is the dates. But we're, we don't fully control that. We're at the, uh, uh, the, the schedule of the uh, engraver. So we need, and we'll try and get on their schedule ahead of time and, and, and have them know that we're a regular occurring, but um, we're a little bit at their mercy. So we'll aim for May and October. Um, we've also talked about this idea of a sunset clause that uh, we're borrowing language from the city of Boise's plazas and, and elsewhere mm -hmm. in the valley, we like uh, this language just up front acknowledging that it's for the lifespan of the facility or amenity. In other words, we're not committing that 300 years from now, it will still be there if, you know, there's a major renovation of the park uh, and, and, and that area gets redesigned as, into something else, then that's the lifespan of that uh, facility. And then we're also, instead of just a free-for-all on the wording, we're going to have uh, approved lines. We'll have three lines of text. Uh, the, the first line will be an approved phrase and it's like in memory of or in recognition of, but there's a lot. I think there was 70 some on the approved list that Boise has and we were gonna just basically copy what they've already been through because they've already you know, worked with this a lot. The second line would be the name of the person with their title or affiliation and then the third line would be their, their dates such as birth and death or if it's to honor someone for something they did in 2018, it could say you know, in, in recognition of so and so 2018. Um, so, uh, the next steps, the, the fees are being noticed right now. The public hearing for these fees is next Tuesday at City Council, and they'll be adopted by resolution. Uh, once we have that resolution approved by Council, then we have the ability to start uh, selling bricks. So, any questions? Okay. I guess I do have one question. How, for the for both um, Kleiner Park and Generations Plaza, who do you go through to purchase? Uh, our department, you just call our front desk, and Ali, uh, Ali oh. Aldape is the person okay. that kind of runs uh, the coordination on that. that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, moving on to new business. We have a forestry update with Roy Huff. Favorite time of the year. Good evening. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for the opportunity to spend a few minutes with you. And, and uh, I don't think I've been here since late last summer or something like that. Can't remember. And uh, so um, tonight I want to take you through just a few things that are related to some things uh, that we were working on last year, late last fall in forestry, and some upcoming stuff for uh, this rest of 2018 budget year. And uh, so we'll just kind of kind of start there. So I've uh, been working on tree inventory, um, some things like that to really know what asset we have and what it's all about. I've been working on that for five or six years. And so uh, right now there's 4,353 trees in park system, in this young, young park system. And uh, when I was working on it the other day, I kind of came up with a estimated value out of the out of the software program of two two point eight million dollars so we really have something that we put into this farm ground around here that's turned out to be very nice and it has a, a long time to go and uh, I think it's I think it's a, a wonderful asset to our community uh, I get to put these powerpoints together a little bit and Shelly has to dollar that for me because I can get it all in there but I can't dollar that she gets all the pictures and makes it look really nice so I appreciate her doing that for me uh, in Rachel's absence. She helps me out, too. So uh, in the last year or so, we've had some really good accomplishments. We've we were, um, been about 17 years as a Tree City USA, and uh, we were able to receive that award again. That's coming this year. Um, the growth award is, is something that is related to uh, what we do in the park system and uh, not how much money we spend, but what we accomplish. And this last year with the parks, the new parks that we built, we were able to do that, to qualify for that. I had to, I had to um, apply for that. We were able to receive that. I think we'll be able to receive that again uh, this year with the addition of the dedication of Hillsdale and then the South Meridian Regional Park unnamed. <laughs> and so, so uh, about 255 trees planted last year. That's a pretty, pretty good number. Uh, so 2018 will be a little bit different. Uh, the, the ones from Hillsdale, South Meridian Park, and then the Pine Avenue project that's going on back here on Pine Street, it's going to have 65 new trees that we're involved in in that. So we're going to get about 400 something. Then I'll be personally working on trees, and I'm usually in the 75 range somewhere, and some of those are new and some of them are replacements. So if you count the new, probably about half. So we're going to be, be in the 430 range of all new trees for this year, and then I'll be out doing inventory all over again like I hadn't even got there. So it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be exciting. Mm -hmm. So I wanna talk a little bit about what we call, what I call the Centennial Park Maple. Behind the community center is that little Centennial Pocket Park. Well, in that park, we had this great big maple. You can see it in the back, background here. Um, now this, may, this is from 2004 when we built the park. This is, there was three old residences there. We obtained that property and made a little trade for it. And um, so that tree looks pretty good right then. Mm -hmm. In a close-up picture, you would, you would notice on the left, what is the left side of the tree, it's not the same color. This picture doesn't show that very well. And uh, so over the next number of years with park development, and watering and everything, we started to notice some things. So uh, I jumped clear up to 2015 on this photo and you can see some decline in that one side. This is a massive tree and uh, this is the biggest one in our park system. And uh, um, I have other pictures in between but I didn't cut down the time, I didn't show those. But between 2015 and 2017, this is where it went. And between all the things that we did or fertilizer, treating, testing, and doing things, we couldn't stop that decline. This is a, this is a Acer saccharinum, it's a silver maple. A lot of those planted in the valley here in the early 1900s, a lot of them around 1945, Civil, um, World War II, lots of trees got planted in this valley. World, around World War II, a lot of memorial type stuff. So 
That was our biggest tree in the park system. We removed it this last fall. We just had, we just got to the point where if you're looking at the hazard, um, not the term on the the risk, you finally get there. And uh, so it was big and uh, it was wide. 65 inch tree is pretty big. And it's pretty big for one of these. And uh, so looking at estimated value, when it was pretty healthy seven or so years ago, $36,000 was kind of what it would be worth. And then you can see that uh, as it declined, so does the value. <laughs> Planted around 1945 is about the best estimate that I can get from that tree. So a couple things here in 2017. You can see this big limb laying here. There's actually two of them. But uh, when these limbs come down, this is probably the fourth or fifth one of these that came off more on the healthy side than on the non side. Mm -hmm. And uh, but each one of these limbs weighs about a thousand pounds. They're pretty. They're pretty big. It took me a little while to cut them up and dispose of them. We were really fortunate that there is a parking lot under there. There is a target there for for tree failure. We were lucky enough not not to have that fail. It was on a weekend. It was just the right time. And, any other time, it would have it would have done some good damage to whatever it came down. Whether it was, there's not too many people there on that side of the tree, but still, there there's a risk factor. Part of this uh, part of this that happens with these big big maples like this is about 35 years ago, this tree got topped up real hard. It was probably 45, pretty big tree. 35 or so years ago, tree topping was pretty common here. And that was just lowering those trees down because everybody thought it was going to be a problem, so they just whack them off. So when they do that, they open up these big blunt cuts on the end of these limbs. Well, then that when they do that, these trees have a real growth response to that. And when they do that, they start growing limbs right out of that blunt cut. So those limbs grow and grow and grow and get big and long, and they just they get rejuvenated and they just take off. And once they get out there about 30 or 40 feet, they're just really not as near as ever connected as good as the original parent limb was. So that's when they start failing, and this one failed like that. And so as this, as this tree went on, it would fail a little bit more, a little bit more. It's just something that you, uh, you find yourself living with a little bit. And uh, you, you finally decide what's, your, what's the acceptable level of risk that you want to deal with. Um, and we, we got there. Mike Barton got me there. We have good discussions about tree stuff. So this is the trunk of that tree. So laying on the ground is 65 inches. It's five foot, six inches tall. It's massive. It's, six, it's 16, 16 feet long. It weighs 16,000 pounds. And we put it over by the park shop. And uh, so I've sealed up the ends on this. It's not very often that you find a silver maple that isn't hollow in the middle. And this one is not hollow in the middle. So I'm working on to see if I can find somebody that can mill this into tabletops. It's a valuable asset. You, you just don't find it very often. I have no idea what kind of steel's in, in the street. I hope there's not any. But um, so we're just, I'm just working through that. Nothing I've ever done before. And um, so it, nobody has a mill big enough to, to mill this tree. It just isn't one out there. And so, um, well, there is one out there. It's 58,000 bucks. And so we're not, I'm not going there. But uh, so I had to find one, but uh, I think it's got some possibilities, and so I've got it. I've got it there, and so there's other lumber that came with this tree. It had a massive amount of lumber, stuff that was like this big up there, and some of it was 20 or 30 feet long. And so we've took that lumber somewhere else to a guy that has a mill, and this spring he'll be milling that. He'll put that into a kiln and he'll dry it, and he'll, he'll put it into two by two by tens probably eight or 10 feet long. We'll bring those back to our shop. We'll put them through our, our mill planer and we'll plane them out for picnic tables and we'll take at least one of these tables and make a picnic table in Centennial Park and we'll put a little stuff on there about the story of this tree. And then if I get any other tables, they're going to the shelter in the Arboretum so I can tell that same story about where that tree came from. So I would think that's gonna be kind of fun and it's, just working through it is a real interesting process. So this is what it looks like now that that tree is gone. If you look back at the, think about the first picture and you look at this one, it's like bare. It's like everything's, it's just like crazy. And so 
what I'm going to do with this now is I'm going to clean all this area. You can see right behind those three cards, there's a big area there we took the stump out. And so I'll plant a Jefferson elm back in there instead of a maple. Elms are very long lived, should grow really good there, and it gets really big. Um, Jefferson elms are, are proven to be very resistant to disease, Dutch elm disease, and a few other things. So I think that's going to be a nice addition to the park. It'll be a long time before it ever looks like that. 30 years it'll look really nice. But, so it's kind of an interesting. I want to talk a little bit about what's going on in uh, 2018 on the Pine Avenue project. Um, Mike and I got involved with that a little bit. We picked a, some species for this. We went down and I got to look at all the trees that were existing on the street, make some comments to Ada County in the early stages about those trees. And uh, there were a lot of trees down there that had been there a long time. A lot of them were not very good. And it, it was clear that there was a lot of excavation back of curb with flood irrigation and uh, stuff. And so it was... Uh, I just, there's just a massive amount of those trees that just have to come out. And uh, sometimes in upgrades, that's the way it works. And uh, so out of 65 new trees, I have 11 or 12 of those varieties, about 14 different varieties of trees, but in sets of five like that, and they'll be scattered through that whole planting. And so a uh, real, uh, real diverse group of trees going back in there. They're all medium-sized trees. You're not going to be able to get the complete boulevard effect out of that street, but um, it, it should be really nice. Um, and then we retained one chestnut on the corner of Second and Pine, one big chestnut tree. I want to talk about that one a little bit. It's an American chestnut. It's about 65 feet tall, big diameter. It's okay. 60 foot spread, really, really a big tree. And in May, it brooms completely white, profusely white, great big, beautiful blossoms. It's extremely good condition. Uh, we're gonna trim it later this spring because it hasn't been trimmed in a very long time. Um, I think it's planted around 1945, and you can see on the slide what I think the estimated value of when I, want, when I put it into the software data on my tree inventory. So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, this time of the year when it's dormant, it just looks like all kinds of stuff there. And, and it's, it's thick, it's, it's in good condition. We had to take a limb off this one side and um, Ada County's going with a new sidewalk underneath it. Well, I couldn't hardly walk under the sidewalk without hitting my head on that limb. So it doesn't meet code for sidewalk clearance. But it went right out kind of towards the house but off the side a little bit. So we determined that taking that limb off was probably the best thing to do. It's, if you look at a few other places on this tree, like up to the right here, there was a limb removed there. And I looked at any other wounds that have probably been in the last 10 or 15 years. It's still pretty vigorous, so I think it can heal that up. You can kind of tell how vigorous they are by how they heal up on, on their cuts. So this is uh, another a way to look at it. It's a very common habit. We took it up. It got took up just a little bit from the street. It actually would get trimmed off every year by trucks. <laughs> So it's up just a little bit, and I couldn't find a way to scale it very good, but the outhouse did a good job showing you how tall it is. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't get that out of the way of the picture. So right here shows where, uh, where the curb was pulled off, and what we learned when that curb was pulled, we were very concerned that, that there might be some roots out into the road, things like that. We found out when the curb came out that they didn't, it didn't, this tree did not root into the road. Elms and sycamores, things like that, yeah. Uh, what it did is actually root root parallel right along the back of curb. There's these great big buttress roots like this and they come right out of that tree and they just turn and go both ways. So you know they're gonna go 40, 40, 50 feet, just like that and then back around and towards the house under the sidewalk. That's very evident. So the new curb goes right back in in the same spot. So we're gonna put that curb back right against those roots. Do everything we can do not to, not to damage them. So this is that, this is that house. And so one thing that we have a little challenge with right now is, is that all these houses were sewered in water, sewered to the back alley. Well now the sewer's in the front. So they've got to come through this tree root zone to sewer it. 
And so we're working with them right with ACHD right now to figure out how to bore this. This root zone has never been excavated on this tree. And so if you see where the one stake is here, about seven or eight feet to the right of this orange stake in the middle is where that line's going to go. So we're going to try to go underneath that root plate and up, up to the house and come, come at a 2%, clear out to the street, 2% uh, grade, and see if we can avoid any more, <coughs> any more damage to this tree at all. It is, it is an excellent specimen. There's another little, another little picture of it. And, uh, but this time of the year, it just doesn't have any of the magnificent, hard, hard to see what it's like. It almost looks like, ooh, that thing's, you know, needs some trimming or something. It does need some, but it is full of live bud, which is really, really cool. So sure interested in uh, all those little things I'm working in. I'm having a lot of, a lot of fun with that. And uh, we'll see if there's anything special that I missed. But if anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to answer those. Uh, it's just kind of crazy what we do sometimes, but planting time's coming and Arbor Day's coming on April the 13th this year, which is like three weeks early. Um, I partnered with the city of Boise to bring a, a speaker in. Uh, he speaks all over the United States about Arbor Day. His program will be about 40 minutes. And then we'll go outside, plant the tree, and do some things. So it's different than what we've done before. I'm gonna give that a one try shot. I'm partnering with the city of Boise. So we'll see how that goes. And that'll be at uh, River Valley Elementary this year. And it uh, should, be, should be exciting. Madam President, I have a question. Because really, you brought up removing trees. And um, I know on Eustick and Meridian, on the corner by Settlers Park, we lost a lot of the huge trees to the expansion. Is there any idea how much that was? I know we had to expand the roads, but and it looked like some of the trees were taken out to prepare for the expansion, and then when they got in there, they actually ended up exposing roots to some of the big trees right there on the corner. Because I remember driving by and seeing them all coming out. <laughs> so you're talking about on the park side? Yes, the Settlers Park corner. Mm -hmm. And then um, what is that, adjacent across the way, there were also large trees going down new stick, but those I think were more like private citizens' right. homes. Right. But I was just wondering, do you Ca track casualties those too? Casualties war, I guess. <laughs> but uh, so the ones in the park side, we did have some removed, and and there were some um, some root zones exposed a little bit. Um, we we kind of determined that some of those trees was okay for them to go, especially on the frontage, because I don't we didn't feel like that they were really growing as well as we would like to. So we're still going to in this summer. I'm going to be in a little project to remove some trees up and down Eustick and change to some other ones. I'm not happy with the growth rate of those trees compared to the ones that are the same ones that go up Meridian Road. They're a lot better. So there's there's something going on with those and it's been going on for a while, but it, they need a little bit of help. And uh, at least on that corner, the big oak on the corner wasn't affected. That's a big tree. That's 40, 44 inch DBH, but and it's planted around 1935 or 40, but it has a 105 foot span and it's 80 feet tall. It's a crazy tree. Like, if you had to estimate, what's that tree worth? Do you 45,000. Oh. That estimated value on that, yeah. I love that tree. <laughs> Thank you. Madam President? Yeah. Um, Elroy, would you give a quick update on the, the downtown tree well process? Um, because I was reviewing that just in the last week, and if I'm not mistaken, between this summer and next summer, we should have all of the old ones completely replaced. Is that correct? We're gonna be really close, Steve. Um, there, there are some of the old trees in the downtown that are still there, but they're not in the original box, 96 boxes there once was, they're actually, on a piece of street that has some landscape strip, but they're still part of our watering system. Those, I don't think, are ever going to be affected by this. But uh, until sometime when they actually do enough damage to, to cause us to have some effect with them or do something with them. So we're getting down to the last eight or nine that actually boxed ones. A few of those um, um, actually pulled the box to see what was going on in there. And I found some trees that were not very stable. I found some others that were really stable. And so I 
There's a few of them I actually put a temporary box back on them. There's no grade on it, but they, they look really good and it took care of any trip hazards, things like that. You can probably run those for a little while longer before they have to come out. But I think next end of this year, and I don't know how much longer MDC will participate, but we're going to be down to where there's just right at the end and there's, there's kind of loose ends on that to where you don't, some trees you want to do and some you just don't want to do because they don't need to be. So it's kind of get it's kind of end like that probably, and then we'll still have a, a budget that we'll work with downtown because there'll always be something that happens down. There's always something to do in the downtown tree. We're just getting um, some of the trees are getting to the 15 year point when I first started putting them back in, and one of them actually actually pushed up a box and caused caused some some issues in a spot. And I was trying to figure out if I could keep that or if I had to take it out. I decided to remove it so I could really see what was going on underground. It was a really good opportunity for me to see what these trees are doing. And they root, they'll go down, root underneath these boxes and just keep running going in the native soil we have. And some of the, uh, the locusts are very advantageous uh, encroaching in the root zone. They don't, they don't care what they're planted in. And they're on Main Street. And so I have another one next to this. The one this year was on, last fall was on Zamzo's, right, right in front of the antique shop. And so I got to plant a new tree back in there, and it did some infrastructural damage. But it took 15 years, so about 15 years is about how long you can really leave one in if it's, if it's a locust. If it's something else, you might, might run a little bit longer. They seem to do very well in there. Um, we're not spending tons of money on maintenance for downtown trees. Put a little bit of fertilizer on them, do a little bit of spray on them, make sure they get water. They're just growing, and we're not having to do, uh, you know, tons of tons and tons of maintenance on them. I'm not saying that they're growing like a real fast rate. We want them to just be there and grow a little bit every year. We don't want to force them too hard because I think that'll shorten up our interval of the time they can stay there. But. Um, it's, it's a good little project. I, I like the tree grates on them, and we have a few that don't have grates on them now, and I think they're great too. So it works, works both ways. So I have a question. I believe last year you were talking about the Arboretum and there was a soils issue with some of the, like some area of the Arboretum. Does that, did you guys ever figure that out? Some of the trees weren't doing well? We've had some trees in the Arboretum that have not done well. Now, part of that reason is when you have an Arboretum, you want to try and plant everything, everything. that you think will live there. <laughs> and I, I planted some that are not going to live there. I can tell you they're not going to. And uh, some of them are very, very uh, just on the edge of, their, of what they can handle for cold. And once they get established, sometimes they're great. But the establishment period, and some of them I planted, and we got some really harsh weather early a couple times. and. It struggled, and then I have some I have some pinion pine and uh, air state, uh, bristlecone pine and Swiss stone pine and, and a couple other ones. And these pines are really nice, but if you water them, you just kill them. So they're really I've got I've got to do some other things in there. I think I'm going to have to make a a area somewhere for those very temperamental pines. They're actually edible seed pines. You can use you can eat their seed, which is what I want. But I think I'm going to have to create an area, take the grass out, and change the irrigation so it can only water them a little bit. Because when we water turf, they just can't deal with it at all. Mm -hmm. So that, that's going on in there. There's a few other trees that I just that don't like heavy clay soil, which we have. It's a couple things like that. But, you know, after, uh, I think we started planting in 11 or 12, well, after a while, you know, you get five or six years down the road, the trees that are going to die are going to die, and the ones that are going to live are going to live. And if you look at it now, you can kind of tell through the park that there's certain trees that are just going to live. And we keep taking, <laughs> taking out and planting different ones. Some of the maples that we had planted in the parking lot on the west side, I had to completely go to a, to a different maple that has much more vigor, hybrid vigor, and that seems to be better. And so some things just don't survive in the heat island environment. And so... Back to the Arboretum, there's just some of that in the Arboretum. Um, and I've got about, I think I've got about 20 more spots in there that I might squeeze things in before I overplant. I want to be careful of that. And so I'm all constantly looking for things. There'll be some, some new and interesting things uh, this year if I can get my hands on them. Some of them 
I've had to wait a long time. Late last fall, I planted an elm in there, and it's an American elm, and I, and I don't have any signing on it yet except to say what it is, but it is an Oklahoma City survivor elm from the Oklahoma City bomb. And I could only get that in like a little, like this, and so I had it in the nursery at Jakers for a couple of years, and now it's like pretty big. And so we put that in in the fall, and I haven't figured out what to say on that yet, but it's not a cutting stock. It's actually a seed stock from that Oklahoma City survivor tree. But all those things are something interesting that people pick up on. And on um, Tuesday, uh, no, say Monday was a really nice day, and so I got a call from a friend of mine. We went to the Arboretum. We spent about an hour there, and he's my, he was my horticulture instructor at Boise State uh, 20 years ago. And uh, so we walked through the Arboretum, and, and he had not been there, never been to Kleiner Park, never been to the Arboretum. So he thought it was wonderful. And he decided I wasn't such a dumb guy after all. <laughs> and so that worked out good. I felt better. And, uh, you know, the, the funniest thing, we were walking around there, and I had this stake stuck on a tree, and I don't know what happened to it, but he walks up and he goes, that ain't not that tree. That's the wrong. That's wrong. I was like, oh, my word. <laughs> so here's your instructor telling you you don't know what you're talking about. And so, and he was right. It's not right. And I knew it wasn't. And uh, so that was fun. And then uh, a lady come by, a nice lady. I've seen her walk the arboretum before, and she come by, and she started talking about being able to read the identification tags and what they meant to her. And I've had these comments before. How wonderful, how wonderful that was. It was really cool because I could say, well, I'm the arborist and this is my horticulture teacher. That was kind of cool. That don't happen too often. So I enjoyed that very much. And it's nice to have uh, somebody that is, a, is one of your peers for a long time come and look at something that you work on and, and think that it's nice. And that, that was a lot of fun. So still got some things to do in there. There's a lot of other things that can happen with the arboretum with identification and and where is it really going and how, what does it really mean to our community? That's all out there. I haven't even, we haven't even touched any of, any of those things yet, but that just takes time to work through that. It works really good if you've got live trees to look at and all that kind of stuff. So I'm still in that establishment stage. So. Thank you. Madam President, okay, I have one more question. <laughs> just with the butterflies, Magnolia, will the one in the memorial be our first for Meridian? No. We do have it somewhere already? You know, it will be the first one. I actually plant an Edith Bogue magnolia in Billy Bowles' place where we got the Christmas tree from. That's an Edith Bogue magnolia. I got mixed up. So that's an Edith Bogue. So that'll be the first butterfly mag magnolia that I'll plant. I have a few other magnolias in the park system, a couple of them in Kleiner. They're more bush type. This is more tree type. And uh, it's not very fast growing, but it'll get 25 feet or so. And, and really beautiful spring blooms. It'll hold them for a few weeks. And so kind of a specimen tree to look at across the street from the Arboretum. <laughs> I won't have one of those in the Arboretum because we have it there. But I'll make sure that it gets well, well documented of what it is because people are going to want to know what it is. So it'll get some, it'll get some signage. You know. and I think it's a really good tree, a really good spot for that. I'm glad you asked. I was going to ask the same question <laughs> about the butterfly magnolia. Well, um, all right. I, I admire the reuse of that Centennial Park maple because hearing that story was kind of sad to hear, but I'm excited to see um, the park tables, so, so tables and benches made out of that. And I, um, I just hope everyone realizes how fortunate we are to have you, Thank you. as the arborist for the city. I always enjoy hearing your presentations. I love trees. So. Thank you all very much. Absolutely. Thank you. The other new business we have is the Neighborhood Park Theming Ideas Discussion. Are we going to discuss this again? Back to me. I just need a minute to bring up the presentation. Okay. Madam President, members of the Commission, uh, we want to engage you tonight in a discussion about uh, some neighborhood park theming, some recent successes, and maybe what, and particularly on what, where, where we want to go next, where we should focus next. Um, 
I know Commissioner Steele and Commissioner Nesmith will particularly, in particular remember the discussions that came about eight to ten years ago when uh, the, the comments started coming that, you know, all of our parks are kind of the same. They, especially the neighborhood parks, we didn't have, uh, so we didn't have, you got to go back in time and realize we didn't have Kleiner Park then, we didn't have uh, some of the things we do today. Um, and all, we had a standard prototype that was working pretty well for neighborhood parks with a similar restroom and a similar picnic shelter and uh, the, some little bit of variation in the playgrounds, but a playground and a you know basketball hoop and a, uh, an open play area and a pathway. And, and they, they, were, they were very similar. And the, the discussion started back then that you know we really want these parks to have an identity. And that started with Kleiner Park, and that was our first big success in making a unique park that was different than anything else, that uh, um, had its own identity, was a, you know, a, a, a true classic urban park, and uh, definitely has its own you know, identifiable theme. Uh, you know, if you saw a bench, you would know it was from Kleiner Park. If you saw, you know, the entry gateway, if you see, you know, it, all the architecture, uh, the, the colors, the theming, it, it, it works together. Um, since that time, we've been trying to play off of that success and, and, and build off of it as we move forward. One of our recent successes is the, the Keith Bird uh, Legacy Park. We worked hard to uh, give that its own unique identity with with the art that uh, had meaning in relation to Keith's life and loves and legacy. And uh, you can see the playing off of the, the pheasants and the pheasant feathers in this one, um, uh, having amenities in it that were geared toward uh, all, all ages, being able to, to, to recreate and play together. Um, Rita Husky. Uh, Park also definitely has its own unique theme. It's got a, a, a shelter restroom combo different from anything else. We've played off of that love of flowers in a way that is truly beautiful. I, I love the way that signage uh, turned out. In fact, one of the things I want to share with you Superior Shelters is the shelter company that um, provided the shelters for these two parks. Um, they've put out their 2018 uh, catalog for, you know, it's a, it's a nationwide catalog, not just, not just local. Uh, the, the front cover, Keith Bird, Legacy Park. Back cover, you might recognize <laughs> as uh, Rita Husky Park. Um, inside, there's some sections they call uh, inspiration for others to look at. and there, it, there's one in New Mexico, there's one in Florida, and then there's Rita Husky Park and Keith Bird Legacy Park. I'll, I'll pass this around so you can take a look at it, but it was pretty remarkable that uh, we got, you know, two inspirational nods for the, uh, the nation to look at in their show. In their So I think we're making some success, full headway, on making some unique identities and, and theming in these new parks. <clears throat> Hillsdale Park is going to open in, in May, and we have a very unique identity for it to celebrate the agricultural heritage of the, the park. We've got the, the tractor on the playground. We've got the, the signage with the cows and the tractors. Uh, we've got hay bale benches that are going in. We've got the family cattle brand in the eaves of the shelter. Uh, we've got a lot of unique elements that um, are, are being used to uh, reinforce that, that celebration of uh, its agricultural heritage that, that that land has had for so long. I don't have any photos because it's not built yet, but South Meridian Regional Park, and I was going to mention the naming here, but we just talked about the... The, the naming process that's underway. But it has this discovery theme, and we're, we'll, I anticipate we'll be before you soon to talk about playgrounds and sand and water play and splash pads. And we've, we've come up with, we're developing this idea of 
um, interpretive panels that um, uh, uh, interpret Idaho uh, wa fish, wildlife, and on one side can be a collage of uh, maybe Idaho mammals, and on the other side is maybe the state symbol of, of that. So Idaho birds and the mountain, and the, the, the mountain bluebird. Or, um, you know, it, just different ways in this park that we keep talking about uh, to make them into learning landscapes and how can you play and learn at the same time. Um, we've got the sand and water play idea that um, uh, resembles the Boise River watershed from Anderson Ranch Dam through Arrow Rock through uh, uh, Lucky Peak and interpreting that in a way that both teaches them about the environment in which they live, but is also just fun to play in, right? Um, so uh, we, we have definitely been focusing on the identity of, of this park. I think this is a great one to touch on. Uh, Heroes Park has been without something to reinforce that hero identity for, for years, and that all changes tomorrow. Um, we hope many of you can come and celebrate with us. Shelly mentioned it at the beginning of the meeting. But tomorrow, Thursday, March 15th, 4 p.m. in Heroes Park, we'll be cutting the ribbon on the new artwork that uh, celebrates a variety of national and local heroes, national heroes on the central art piece, but, and local heroes that were nominated by local schools um, ar around, the, around the pathway. So uh, that, that's gonna be a great addition to that park that helps to reinforce that park's name and identity. Um, so what else do we have out there? We've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven other neighborhood parks, um, 8th Street, Centennial, Champion, Chateau, Gordon Harris, Renaissance, and Seasons. Uh, this discussion has been going on over the last year with the what was the, the parks uh, uh, committee, uh, and it was decided that as those committees were dissolved this year, that this was really something that the entire commission cares about and ought to weigh in on. Um, that, that committee's focus uh, for the next round, that I think there's been uh, three parks that have been pulled out to, to maybe consider. Champion Park and Renaissance Park were kind of the top two, and then there was mention that uh, also Seasons Park has an identifiable name that could be, you know, it's a kind of ready to, uh, to build off of. But uh, this is where I'm hoping for your discussion because um, we're just about to wrap up that Heroes Art Project. I think we have an opportunity to go back to the Arts Commission and say, thank you, now let's do another one. Um, and my question to you is, where should we go next? You know, I'd really like to come away tonight with an idea from you about you know choosing one, you know, and we, we could you know prioritize because we won't we want it, this is an ongoing process and choosing one doesn't mean it's the only one. But I'd like to start the discussion around one and, and developing ideas for for what it what it can be, and we don't have to decide tonight you know exactly what it is, but we can talk about ideas. We can talk about you know which one of these would you uh, go to next. Um, you know, Champion Park was, it's similar to Heroes, but I think it was more, when it was originally built, and Commissioner Steele can probably give more history on this than I can, but I think the idea when that park was, was built and named was to possibly celebrate um, local sports uh, related champions or, you know, coaches or that kind of thing uh, that, that were, were noteworthy. Um, you know, Renaissance Park is down south in all the, the Tuscany and, and, and those uh, subdivisions down there. There's a theme there that could be uh, played off of with, you know, Italianate or Renaissance type uh, uh, art or something. And then Seasons Park, there's obviously a, an opportunity to, to celebrate uh, the seasons, uh, changing of colors, uh, leaves, you know, any number of ways we could, we could do that. So I want to stop talking for a minute, maybe ask Commissioner Steele if he has any specific input on Champion Park or any of these, but then just 
ask for any feedback if there is one that you'd like us to try and engage the Arts Commission in a discussion about. Madam President. Uh, yeah, you were exactly right with Champion Park. Don Hutt, years ago, um, he played football at Boise State. So grew up in the area. Don Sorry. Hutt. Okay. Um, yeah. And anyway, he uh, wanting to just do exactly what you said with him growing up around here and playing at Boise State and everything. Um, all the streets around there are named after local coaches, um, you know, with all of all of them throughout uh, years and years and years in Boise, Meridian, different areas. Um, so that was exactly the whole thing behind it was more of the sports kind of champions kind of things, different from Heroes Park where, you know, um, it was that kind of, the you know, a different kind of hero champion or whatever you want to call it. So really geared around the sports, sports theme. Um, and originally it was not called champion subdivision either. Hmm. Um, he did that after we named the park. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was his way to get around the can't name the park after the subdivision. So <laughs> he just named the subdivision after the park. So it, it was it's kind of funny. But, um, yeah. Uh, so if we can kind of keep with that theme, and I don't know, it would kind of be tough. But you could keep it to a straight sports kind of theme um, without having the soccer fields or anything like that, more the legendary kind of coaches, that kind of thing. That's really what it was geared for. Okay. So thank you. There's obviously also things we could do with the Renaissance uh, theme or the season's theme. And so any discussion about any of them? Do you have an opinion on which park needs hmm. theming Great question. first? Um, you know, I'd, I'd probably go to either Champion or, or Renaissance next. Mm -hmm. uh, both have been talked about for some time. Um, both have a, th a theme that's kind of ready to be celebrated or developed further. Um, um, for, for me, between those two, it's, it's kind of a toss-up. The only reason I didn't put Seasons in there um, is because Seasons does have an art piece in it now it does not reinforce the seasons theme, but there's there's a, a a bronze sculpture of a young girl reading a book on a rock. It's 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 beautiful. It's really nice. It was donated by for, former Mayor Corey, um, but it, but because that park has some art in it, I'm trying to you know I think of the other two first because they don't, um, but certainly uh, you know reinforcing the seasons theme is something that that has not been done there. Uh, for me, Champion and Renaissance uh, jump out, and one's in the north, one's in the south. You know, because we just did one in the north, we could do one in the south, but we're also doing two new parks in the south. So I, I guess I'm not having a strong feeling one way or the other, and we just, that's why I wanted to bring it to the commission and say, is there, is there one that stands out to you? Madam President. Again, it, this dates back before... Actually, I think anybody up here was on the commission with Renaissance. Um, ideally, when we first started talking about theming, they wanted to go with, it was talked about going with that whole Italian theme. You know, and there was the winery out on the way to Emmett mm -hmm. that has, you know, the grape arbors and all that kind of stuff that they really thought that that would be a good plan for that park, kind of a leisure, create some shade at the same time, maybe put some bocce ball courts in something like that to kind of bring that whole renaissance kind of theme to that park so just to throw that out there madam president so emily i have a question for you we all live in meridian but i specifically live like right next to one of these parks is it all right if i i mean can i post an opinion or a vote or because i live so close to one or is that kind of against some kind of you know <laughs> <laughs> um, Madam Chair, Commissioner West, that is totally fine. In fact, that's why you're on the commission is because you like parks and you know about them and you live near them. So your input on that is just fine. All right. So I Thank would you. definitely want to go with Champion Park because <laughs> I love <lived> it. <laughs> and also a couple reasons why I think that would be a good park to do. 
it's growing significantly right there on Eustick, right across from, is where all the um, new development is coming in and right next to Hobby <coughs> Lobby. So we're going to have all these kids and families coming. So a nice park right there would be wonderful. And also recently a tree was removed. I don't know why, but right off the parking lot, one of the oh, yeah. big trees was taken out. Do you know why that was removed? I believe Elroy's gone, but I think that one was damaging the, the was, sidewalk next to the parking lot. Yep, exactly. It was lifting all the concrete. So there's some, you know, some people have no idea, and then it might just flow into, oh, we're preparing to put in the art. It kind of, we're already working on that part because we just took out something. So then at least there's something to look forward to coming back into the park. Yeah. That's my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> and I think to add on to that, because there is already kind of um, an implied theme, it, would be fairly simple to come up with some ideas for the theming of Champion Park. Mm -hmm. And Madam President, um, I really don't care which one of these we start with to do art, because I know down the road we'll add themes to all of these parks. Um, but for Renaissance Park, I don't think we would need to stick to an Italian mindset, because the Renaissance was all about learning and just expanding our knowledge so it could be very similar to the discovery theme or I don't know we could just have kids are really excited by things like painted footsteps on the ground or maps painted on the ground that they could interact with or draw chalk on top of so I think we could kind of expand the renaissance park theme to be more based on just learning and art Anybody else? Madam President, I, I agree with uh, that statement. And I, I also agree, I think, given the amount of work that we're already doing in the South Meridian with uh, the new parks, it would be beneficial to maybe look at theming Champion Park. And it, it's a pretty, I don't want to say easy, but it's, it's, it's got some, some boxes around it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Whereas Renaissance could be really wide if you start to really dig into what Renaissance was all about with the art and the exploration. And that might take a little longer where Champion could be something that could be completed in a, a smaller amount of time mm -hmm. to get ideas and really draw that sports component to it. Mm -hmm. Madam President. Um, no, I, I totally agree. I think Champion would be the better one. It is kind of blah, and it does get something on the north side to throw in there. Um, I think out of all of our parks, Champion probably needs the most help, I would think, just because of how it's laid out, and it's pretty much playground, bathroom, and grass, you know, the shelter, but yeah. Anybody disagree with okay. that? Kind of sounds like Champion is the champion. I'm, I'm hearing Champion um, as the next one. So um, we will let the Arts Commission get through tomorrow, and then we'll uh, <laughs> say thank you. Let's do another, and uh, and and see. I don't know. I, have, I standing here today. I don't know what their their budget is, what their other commitments are, but they do have an annual, you know, budget, and we can, uh, you know, if if. We won't get what we don't ask for. So uh, I, I'd love to continue that partnership. We have lots of opportunities to continue uh, offering opportunities for art in the parks. And uh, if, we can, if we can do that with Champion Next, we'll offer that. OK? That's awesome. That's all I have. So thank you very much. Thank you. So now we have the Pathways Workshop, which has Kim same all over it. Madam President, Commission members, welcome to the Pathways Workshop. This is my first. Um, and so I'll rely on Steve or Mike if I deviate too much from standard protocol. Uh, rein me in. Um, so initially, well, recall I've been here 
between five and six months now. Time has gone a bit faster than I anticipated. Um, and originally this workshop, I think, happens in the fall. And we postponed it a bit just so I could be more familiar with the system. So um, I'm going to give an update on some of the goals that were existing when I got here and what has happened towards those outcomes, and then propose some new priorities for the year ahead, um, some things that have surfaced. And a side note, I thought I recognized the Sidaway family here in an earlier incarnation, so thank you, Steve, for um, if, if any of you want to check out the cover photo just quickly. Daughter on the far right is the one that just got married in December, if you can believe it. Also, I did not have the benefit of Rachel and some nice animations, and there's a lot of text here, so I'll try to move kind of quickly. I promise I won't read to you. Um, one second. If you'll excuse me, I'm just going to find Okay, so this first goal um, it essentially says build the H2 pathway from Badly to Fairview. Um, this has happened. This will be on the parks tour. Um, there's a fair amount of verbiage about easements and permits, all of which was largely in place by the time I got here. Um, so for each of these goals, um, there's the goal stated and then the purpose, and I've tried to hold to this format, but the purpose seems to be kind of the underlying reason that we're doing the goal. Um, so again, we're focused on Five Mile Creek. This is complete. Uh, goal number two is rail with trail. We've been focused on the half mile segment just west of City Hall, um, and it's been a little bit difficult to uh, to get going. Um, we are negotiating for right-of-way. We ran into a bit of a snag, um, and Mike has been the pretty skilled by default negotiator for um, actually acquiring a parcel. So this is moving forward. Um, if we spend federal funds on this project, we will, and, and we do have some um, allocated that we can take advantage of, but they require a fairly extensive permitting process. So. Um, I'm getting a little off track. Um, this is moving forward, the short-term segment, and then there is also a longer-term effort. Um, I think we're viewing this as a politically important project for rail with trail, though it's technically not rail with trail, but as an example of what could happen in or near the corridor, um, just to help advance the regional cause for rail with trail, which is still a bit of a ways out. In terms of a purpose to create a fully connected pathway across the city, um, in talking with Steve and also in working on the Pathways Master Plan a couple of years ago, um, I know there were, there were so many needs in the Pathways system that uh, Steve was mentioning it was decided to really focus those efforts and Five Mile Creek became the focus of that. So if this is a main spine and we can really start to build some connectivity along there, um, then, then maybe we'll make, we'll have a greater effect with the resources that we do have. So in terms of, I'm not going to get into all those special segments. Uh, we are still working on some of those, um, but it is now possible to travel nearly five miles on the Five Mile Creek pathway. Uh, some of that is street, routes, but um, I, I did a run a few months ago and it was kind of cool. So um, we're definitely building some mileage. Uh, in terms of alternate funding sources, uh, there was a goal to pursue additional sources. Um, and this helps our funds go for, farther with the city. Um, we did submit for a grant application for the Limp Larkwood pathway, and we had an okay standing on that. Uh, I think for a larger size city, which we were, uh, we didn't get any funding. Um, I think most of those funds went to smaller municipalities. Um, and then as I mentioned already, federal funds have been allocated to construct segment D in 2022, and then rail with trail sometime in the future. I feel like I should move along. 
Okay, and then um, some talk uh, I've had thoughts on evolution of pathway signage. We do have some identification signs, say for the Bud Porter pathway. Uh, we have some directional pathway signs with mileage. Um, and I guess I have more to say about that in future goals in terms of um, what's possible for pathway identity. Um, but the short version of progress here is that, yes, we have Along the H2, the new segment, we have installed some new pathway signs, and also some exist in other areas. Um, this goal, I believe, fell off the priorities for the Park Commission at large, um, but it was to provide, um, partner with ACHD to provide some links to downtown, between downtown and the pathway system, and that's currently occurring with the Pine Avenue project. Um, that Elroy mentioned, I know, with trees. Um, and there are some pathway components, such as a pedestrian, oh, what is, I think of it as an eddy space, the planners say, but um, a pedestrian sort of refuge of Pine Avenue. Goal number seven, um, I think that we have a lot of great momentum with pathways here. Um, but as soon as we can connect to the Green Belt and the river and work with other communities, especially the city of Eagle, to do that, the faster we have a regional system or a tie into that. So that continues to be a priority. Um, I do have, I have had intermittent and ongoing contact with Steve Noyes at the city of Eagle. In fact, I talked to him just the other day about um, you know, what what links to from Meridian to Eagle are we developing? And I told him of two that have been identified and one that I have my eye on, even though it isn't part of the plan yet um, on the 10 mile extension set for the future. So um, we've had some good interaction. We've can participated in their master planning process. So um, I think that we do have some big barriers in terms of transportation, um, but we are working on getting north, which will open up a whole new um, variety of destination. Another goal, and this one I imagine comes around every year, is to to update our pathways map. Um, we, I know, just since I've been here, either pathways have been built, and/or I've noticed that oh, you know, I'll go in reviewing a plan, visit a site, and think there's pavement. Where on the map it doesn't show pavement, so. Um, I'm in the process of updating this, and um, more on this subject later, too. Um, but we, as I understand it, present an updated map to council every year for adoption, um, so it becomes official in terms of our plan review. So that's planned. Uh, I don't have a date set, but it needs to happen this spring. Um, Steve and I talked about this briefly, and I think maybe Commissioner Steele and Steve took a field trip relative to Locust Grove and the ability to get north. Um, and I apologize, this slide, I had a copy error, so <laughs> this isn't what I wanted to say. I transposed from report style to slideshow. Um, but I think that the, the consensus or the recommendation would be to um, let this let the pathway north along Locust Grove. There's a fair amount of existing pathway, 10-foot pathway, on you know one side of the street, and then some that jumps. Um, but the remaining portions, I think, are ideally will be development driven. So um, that one is lower in terms of priorities. Did I get that right, Steve? I think yeah. Yeah, it it's high priority in terms of desire. It's lower priority for our funding because there is development that will continue that connection. So when you can see empty parcels and things, someone will come in and redevelop, and then that can be a requirement of their flat permitting process, um, then we can simply say what we want and require the development entity to, to implement. OK, so that takes us to the end of uh, the summary of past goals. Does anybody have any questions before I move on? Keep going. Um, so Steve, if you can pull up this other. What's that? I'm on the right slide. Yeah, you're on the right slide. 
I won't linger too long on this one. Um, but these are, um, I think this is listed as a brainstorm. So we did come to you with, I've been kind of grappling with this information. Some of it is still a little bit new to me um, and tried to organize it so it made some sense and not totally overthrow any past patterns. Um, I have color coded it. So you all have a list of priorities. They aren't necessarily, the numbers don't necessarily indicate priority order. Um, Rather, I've organized them according to some of the more major, um, we were calling them, pardon me, oh, purposes, or overriding goals, so Five Mile Creek, or is it real with trail? I have a category called nuts and bolts, which is just kind of either pathway maintenance and upgrade or missing teeth kind of in the system. So um, that's the way I organize these, <coughs> pardon me, where interested in knowing, um, these are, I guess, it's our first draft at what we think is important for me to spend my time on this upcoming year and for department resources to be applied to. Um, so do you agree? Um, I think whatever on the, is on this list is a priority to us and we can talk about how those may shake out. Some of implementation, as I'm sure you know, there'll be an opportunity or a funding source, or so it will shift in terms of how it actually happens depending on, and some of these are actually underway. So um, we'll come back to the overall list at the end, and I'm gonna go through it in just a bit more detail in terms of things we think could happen. I've also divided it into projects or actions that build out the system, um, more built environment kinds of considerations, or, and then at the end, planning tools and process improvements, which are a bit more internal, but things that I've noted maybe could be useful uh, since I've been here. So goal one, complete lender sidewalk widening. Um, I have some bullets that would, you know, that tell a little bit about each goal. This one is under contract and it's set to start pretty soon this spring, and we hope to wrap up sometime in the early fall. Um, this would continue, this is one of the expansion projects identified um, for wider sidewalk to create stronger connections along the Five Mile Creek pathway. So this goes back to that focus on a single spine of contiguous pathway through the system. Goal number two is also oriented with Five Mile Creek goal and it's very similar. Um, widen the James Court sidewalks. This is a little residential street off of Meridian Road that connects um, different, connects I think the Bud Porter segment to one to the east along a drain. Um, so um, we have made some progress on this, but there's still um, easements and right of way to acquire. Um, we have some plans that are underway um, and could be finalized quickly. So it's our hope to bid this project uh, in the later part of this year. Um, where they, and I didn't include photos of a lot of these items because we are going on the Pathways Tour. Um, and so these will be points of interest, most of them that we'll highlight and talk about. But there's a stretch where each two, the new pathway comes out on Fairview where it's this beautiful pathway and it's off the street and it's wide and then you hit Fairview and there's some raised curb that kind of delineates the space for pedestrians and there's and then you head east to a crossing at Lakes Place and it, it works just fine. I've been on this route as a pedestrian, but it's a little sketchy along the side of Fairview. So and this is definitely an area where we could strengthen and make it feel like part of a pathway system through the use of paving or design or I think there are some barriers like utility poles and signage, commercial type things and we'll need to acquire easements. So I think this could make a real difference in terms of the perceived continuity of the Five Mile Creek pathway um, and, and some safety, it would really enhance safety as well. Um, you've heard about the 10 Mile Road Trailhead. This came out of discussions with ACHD uh, and seemed like there were some opportunities for us um, to be involved with their road widening project and do a cost share. So, um, and this also ties into Five Mile Creek Pathway. Um, Madam President, I just have a question and maybe you addressed this at the beginning, but when we're looking at number one, it kind of hit me, the Linder sidewalk, 
is, is the number four on the map, it looks like, and number one is four. Oh, right. Um, so the map numbers, and I'll get to that, oh, um, so but that is a little confusing. Okay. They, um, thought, that's more just the like, sequence I, that we would, um, that we would, we'd probably start, we were going to start at H2 because we're okay. doing the dedication and the ribbon cutting, and then as we wind our way out, yes, those stops are a little later on, so they're more chronological on the map, and these are just listed more according to um, the, you know, the content of Five Mile Creek or whatever the, the underlying um, purpose of the goal was. So I hope that explains it. <laughs> it isn't too confusing. I've just been trying to map them out as you yeah, see Yeah, no, it, that's a good point. But um, yeah, the map's kind of a separate thing. Uh, so advance the Rail with Trail pathway projects. Um, primarily, our focus is going to be local. Um, we, as I mentioned before, acquiring right-of-way. Um, we have some plans that can be finalized. There is a regional component in terms of some support to higher level efforts, I know. Um, and I think this pathway is going to happen um, because people who have more power than definitely I do, you know, are talking about why this is a regional resource. And so if we have any opportunities to support or provide information to those efforts, that's kind of a, an auxiliary note. Uh, I think our primary focus will be local. Uh, I think that continuing to work to connect Meridian to the Boise River is hugely important for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Um, so, you know, we do coordinate with Compass and, and support other interagency efforts to, to try to build regional connections. Uh, it's a slow process. It's good that people are talking, I think, in a bigger picture way. Um, and then what I'm calling these nuts and bolts projects are, they're not too glamorous, but they're either necessary and or, you know, this one is the Lemp Larkwood pathway is connecting dots. So it started a couple of weeks ago, construction, they're taking out some trees, they have um, rebuilt this irrigation structure here so that we can have an at-grade pathway crossing. So that's underway um, and it will enhance uh, pedestrian safety for people along McMillan Road, just east of Meridian, between Meridian and Locust Grove. Uh, and then uh, Mike and I visited a couple of weeks ago the Blackstone segment of Ten Mile Creek. This is a, um, I'm calling it the Ten Mile Crook, actually, because it's a really sharp bend in the pathway. And I did include just a plan view picture of this since we won't be seeing it on the field trip. Um, but down here, there's this almost right angle curve in the path, no, that's it. I was a little bit awry. Um, <laughs> the pathway crooks around um, what was an existing tree, so it makes a really sharp bend. It's not ideal from a, you know, a rider point of view, and then there's some bank erosion in that area. So this isn't really a glamorous project, so much as it's a question of this needs to be done, and we've had some conversations with Nampa Meridian Irrigation District, who seems to be a willing partner in terms of doing some work within the actual drain. So um, that's another one. And, and then to talk about pathway signage, um, I certainly don't want to come in as the new person and reinvent pathway signage. Uh, I don't really think there's an advantage to that so much as um, to hearken back to some of the ideas we talked about with the 10 mile trailhead where we want to build identity for our system. Um, we want people to know that it's here as a resource and have a little bit more visibility, probably from the roadways, because that's how a lot of people are going to think, oh, yeah, there's, there's a trailhead, there's pathway. Um, so in terms of wayfinding, uh, I think it would be great to increase visibility. I think we want the signage to be intuitive and simple, and I think some of it may need to be a little bit more simple. Um, and I know that Steve also mentioned the this is more of a map issue, I guess I'll hold on that um, and come back to that idea. So continued evolution of pathway system signage and thinking a little bit in terms of brand. I mean, Meridian has a brand, but does the pathway, you know, can we refract that so that the pathways, you know, how do, how do pathways feel in those terms? And then updates, improvements to this GIS pathways map. I have had a bit of frustration since I got here. I'm, 
interested in GIS and I'm just now really learning how to work within it, um, but I felt a little bit separated from the data. And there is a need, and ideally I think it would happen quarterly, um, it, now that I'm beginning to have the ability to actually make those some of those changes myself, um, it's easier to get new constructed pathways into the system. Sometimes there are areas of obsolescence where the routes have changed or some, some, a pathway was built elsewhere and those changes just need to be noted. Um, so the idea, and I got this phrase from some of help in GIS, the idea that I might be the data steward of pathways information and have a more direct relationship to that. It's been a little slow. It's been something that I've been working on in the background kind of as I've gone along, um, but it's, it's coming along and, and I think that um, with a bit more work it can be a more dynamic tool and keep that data, at least the working map, a little more current during plan review. Um, and I think what I had alluded to earlier in terms of the line bike we were talking about, if there were um, bike programs that were ab activated and they had some sort of a navigation um, interface possibility, which that bike enterprise doesn't yet, but they have spoken to, um, that could be really cool, I think, if, if our maps could translate to, to that. So to kind of be thinking in those terms moving forward. Um, and I didn't mention the shift to more planning tools and process improvements, but um, this is one of them. Um, in working with some people in community development, they have created cut sheets for um, the development community, but kind of almost like development for dummies. I hate to use that phrase, but um, where you can go online and you can download a form that's like two or three pages that would say um, an easement is required as part of this subdivision approval. So to get an easement, talk to this person, you'll need this form, you'll need these kinds of submittals. Um, I think it would lighten the informational exchange rate for staff to do that if we had this information easily available. Another thing I get questions on all the time is, I'm next to a waterway, do I need a fence? How does that work? And we have some, in fact, it was on the cover page of this presentation. We do have a lot of standard sections for that, but they're buried in our master plan, and it's not that unfriendly, but I think if we could isolate those on some information sheets. I just was really impressed with Brian and planning who had done that and I think that would be an easy translation for some of our pathways information just to, um, to kind of smooth the process along. And this one may be a bit further out, but as I review plans, um, and it feels good, but I, to make notes and say that Pathways shall be constructed to city standards per our master plan. And you know, I think known development entities work in good faith and probably build these pathways uh, to our specifications, but we don't really know that. And it, it can be a comprehensive effort or can take a lot of resources to ensure that that happens. But I think uh, it would be worthwhile to begin to address you know, a bit of quality control for pathways that are built. Um, and I don't, I don't know how that happens exactly. Um, it's just something that I know I say when I do the plan reviews, build them according to our standards, and then uh, we can see that they're built, we can see that the easements are dedicated. We can't always see if the, you know, if the pathway, I mean, it's harder to tell um, unless there's some inspection along the way or some submittals required for asphalt mixes or base compaction. Or, so um, again, that one may be a bit more of a future Goal, but I think it's important in terms of long-term maintenance and yeah, do you want to say something? I do. I just want to say that uh, this, is, uh, this is where we can rely on some expertise from the commission and our new commissioner, Mike Pepin, has some expertise on the public works side and knows how that process works for them and we'll be able to draw from that expertise and figure mm -hmm. out how to adapt that to ourselves and maybe okay. draw from some resources that we don't even know are available. Right. Yeah. Some of them I stumble upon, I know, in my conversations with people, but that's a good lead. Do you have any particular comment yeah, on that? Yeah, Madam President, to Steve and to your point is you're only going to, if you're accepting this capital investment by the developer, it's only going to be as good as you can verify because they will attempt to Cut corners. save in the areas that they can. Public Works, while understaffed, they do have a great team that provides utility inspections. 
totally different funding mechanism than what you're up against. You would have to work with, you know, right off the top of my head, you don't want code enforcement out there looking at that stuff. That's totally different. But you would have to look at some type of a project management inspector to yeah. follow up on these. Um, I'm sure you've probably got experience with that. I know Mike does, but how much can you spread uh, a few resources out to make sure that these donated projects are to your standards? Um, from my experience, Public Works battles that every day, and the city invests uh, additional resources to bring them up to speed sometimes. You're probably hit with the same exact issues from time to time, so. Yeah, and this may just be identifying it as something to tackle in the future. I mean, I feel like I have plenty of, of breadth in terms of responsibilities and things to do. Um, but, but yeah, it, it kind of rankles. It's, well, I think, any project has to have like, a final walkthrough yeah. with a punch list. True. I think yeah. that's where you tackle it, yeah. and you don't accept it until someone with a with the knowledge base that you're looking for on these types of donation projects uh, right. signs off on it, yeah. Would it be possible to um, require a third party testing agency? Yeah, um, <laughs> Madam President, I was gonna, do that. gonna add that there's, there's two types of pathways that could be built out there by the development community and it's the pathways that we will not maintain and it's gonna be owned and operated by a homeowners association so we have that, and then we have the pathways like a, maybe a section of Five Mile Creek or something else that we would take over for maintenance at some point in the future. So the, the majority of the pathways that are being built by development we'll never maintain. That's but, true. but we want them to be a long-lived asset for those people and for citizens to cross. We don't want it to crumble and fall apart, obviously. Um, but the you know, financially, it's not going to be on us to to repair shoddy workmanship. Um, but I, I I know that you know while we're struggling or not struggling, but putting a process in place to improve the overall um, you know checks and balances. That if there was something that was going to be built by someone else that we were going to own and operate, we would be out there with tighter with more inspections and tighter controls. We'd want to see base compaction in different sections and, you know, based on geotech technical reports. And so we would, right now we would do that. We're just, this goal is a good one to, for the betterment of this system as a whole. So moving on and getting back to this priorities list, um, I guess I would, entertain any input on that? Is there anything that you feel may not belong or maybe so far in the future it's not as relevant? Uh, as I mentioned, some things are kind of already happening. Um, do you have any comments or any um, specific um, priorities according to your points of view? Madam President, good <coughs> list. I heard you say earlier that they're not necessarily in priority order, so I would just suggest taking the numbers off. Mm -hmm. You're the expert. Um, it's your role and responsibility to shepherd the list and bring updates, not just to us, but those, those other entities. I don't know that we need to prioritize, at least this commission, um, the, the body of work for you to do on pathways when most of these are already in motion already. Obviously, the, the squeaky wheel gets the, the grease from time to time. So it's, I think it's going to be a fluid, transparent adjustment. And as you bring timely updates, we work on it at, at that pace rather than say, well, we're doing number four, number first, because we voted on it. That, that doesn't, I guess, you're the professional. So that's, and I that's my opinion. I do think this is, yeah, it's less formal than say the priorities we, that you all voted on that were tabulated and, and you're exactly right that, and, and in some sense, I guess one through four, because they uh, point toward progress along Five Mile Creek pathway, which is a fairly major priority. I mean, that falls into place pretty nicely. Um, and those may sort of rise and fall depending, I guess I'd be curious for input on the, 
more of the process improvement, um, if you have any input on those. I think a lot of the projects that we mentioned kind of, yes, you're right, are happening or maybe need to happen or they're in a, something that's come up like the 10 mile trailhead that we're kind of excited about. Um, but do you, is, do you agree that this list covers it? Is there anything that shouldn't be, should be retired from the list or maybe moved out or um, I'm happy to just move on if this looks good. My only suggestion on your last comment on the on the bottom parts, mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of GIS and mapping. Me That's too. my personal um, <laughs> go-to. Mm -hmm. um, I think our community could actually see that tool in action and we don't use it enough. If I had to prioritize your improvement areas, I'd put the GIS mapping. We have a team in IT that does that stuff for us. Um, Thank that's you. where I yes. would move. That's where I would move my priority. I think that's your return on investment. Um, yeah, I have in found, that area. In fact, just in the last couple of weeks, um, and I've been interested in it. I have limited exposure to GIS, and I've built some skill. It's kind of hard to do that as you try to do your job. But um, just to get a little bit more connected to the data and get a, a pathways map that I really like that shows the features that I want, and I think that, um, yeah, ultimately, and I may have sort of rushed past this, but I think that we could, whatever's available online could be a much better tool for the community to map a route. If you were interested in planning a run, I know there was a, a press article on a, written by a runner who's been exploring Meridian. I didn't talk to her, but you know, I think, boy, it would really be cool if you could sign on and say, you know, I wanna do about this many miles. And you know, once the system gets to be more extensive or, um, and I know that in community development, um, Brian has a program that will you know, measure walkability. So if we can integrate those kinds of, of functions, I think um, the, the data could be a lot more useful. I felt like what we have been working from was hard for me and I've been working to get to know it enough to, to, to max, or not maximize its capability, I probably won't get there, but to further it and, and feel like it's really a tool. So yeah, I would, I would be really receptive to that as a, a priority for the blue, the blue items. Madam President, uh -huh. um, what I would offer maybe just to summarize and to reiterate where this discussion is going, I, I agree that we do not need to take the time to prioritize this list. We are asking, do we have the right list? Oh. Um, so we, we'd like, just like to, you to weigh in as to whether we have identified the right priorities uh, to be working on over the next, you know, over the course of this year. Madam President, um, I, I think every point or every item that you've went through makes sense why it's on your priorities list. I think it looks great. Um, I'm really excited for the day number six on the continue working to connect Meridian to the Boise yeah. River Greenbelt comes along. So if there ever was an opportunity, but I know everyone's in the same boat with that and we all want to connect as soon as possible. So. Everything looks great. Yeah, I agree. Anybody else? Agree Madam President? It. Yeah. I would, ag I agree. It's the right list. I think it's the right things to be working on. Um, but I too would agree that probably GIS mapping is more important than some of the other process components, mainly to make it the information accessible and usable and for people to be able to know exactly where the pathways are. Because I think that is the one piece we kind of miss. Um, if I didn't have this map, I would have no idea where things were, even as a commission member. And I felt that way coming in. I mean, I had worked on the Pathways Master Plan chapter, and I'd seen the map, and it, I think I always felt like it was a little vague. And it's not vague if you've been here for years working on the system and you can picture it all in your head. But if you can't, mm -hmm. um, I felt like things weren't labeled, and it, it, it's a challenge. It's a big area of impact, so to, to try to figure out how to convey that and, and be detailed enough, but you know, it seems like GIS might be the best way to do that. So it's been a frustration to me um, just to, to try to get a better data a map, a display that you can share and that's more interactive for staff and for, I mean, it's there, I think. All, there's all kinds of good information there. It's just a matter of wrangling it into something that's really useful from a pathways point of view. So um, do we need oh. oh go ahead. Two, two quick comments on this one um, I agree and uh, you know GIS and the data can can help the um, 
so there's the, the online access to the information that we can provide through GIS. In the field, though, that number nine, you know, if, you, if, if it was just obvious where the pathway went and there, and there was wayfinding, and we've been making progress in that. We've been adding signage. There's still more we can do. The mayor is incredibly passionate about, about that, and we, I think there is more we can do. Um, uh, so yes to both of those. The second point is it's kind of exciting to think about what could happen if this uh, bike share uh, partnership does come about. They're huge on data. They're huge on route mapping. They're huge on getting that information easily accessible through apps to the public. So if there is something, if there is a partnership there to be had, that may be the best way to get that GIS data in the uh, hands of the citizens with a usable app that uh, someone can, can, can look at routes and, and things. So, you know, more to, more to come on that, but both on the, the data-driven GIS side and the wayfinding in the field side, I think those are uh, two sides of the same coin that are both very important. I agree, and I think the GIS pathways map that data would actually draw people to the pathways. I'm sitting at home and I'm trying to find a way to go. If I'm gonna take my dog for a walk, then I'm gonna be looking at my phone, so. Yeah. Madam President, nice to have a question along those. So would that mean I could look it up in Google Maps? Is that what you're saying with the GIS? Is that that or that we would have to have a separate map or a separate app? You can speak to that. I'm just, it's more of an interest, yeah. that's all. I was just wondering. It would, would be great. <laughs> it's a separate, it'd be a separate application that they'd have to make available um, I don't know that would be very interactive, but it would, it would allow you to point and click and identify features on a map that shows the pathway with certain information. You can hide a bunch of stuff behind it too. So it's a, it's a powerful tool that, um, that we can leverage. Yeah. yeah. So do we need a motion on this or should we just move on with verbal? I think a motion would be welcome. That way when we do report to council, we can say that the commission has accepted this as the priorities for the coming year. So I think a motion is in order if we could request one. Okay, so could I get a motion to approve the 2018 Pathways Priorities list as proposed? Madam President, I move that we approve the Pathways Priorities list as proposed. Craig still seconds. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay. This so, is awesome. Um, shall we move on to the next item then? Which, actually, Steve, I might, we'll see how this looks. So I think it's fine. Um, this is just kind of a rough draft of the map for our pathways to our next month. I have never been on a pathways tour either, but they sound informal and bike pedestrian oriented and kind of fun. So um, the Oh, there's one change on here. Bring up, one? bring up the other one, yeah, if you would. It's just the PDF. Is that there? Can we go full screen? So um, the tour would start with our ribbon cutting uh, dedication of the H2 pathway segment here at number one. Um, number two is the area along Fairview Avenue. And again, just Ms. West, I apologize that these don't line up with the goal numbers. Um, but number two is the segment on Fairview that's just not very pedestrian friendly. Kind of works for now. Um, number three are the James Court sidewalks. So um, we can talk about a couple of easements yet to get there. Um, but you know, and it works as part of the pathway. Uh, it just could work better and, and provide a little more uh, with. Then moving on to number four, um, the Linder Sidewalk Project, which will probably be under construction or close by the time we set out. And then a cluster of points of interest near the wastewater treatment plant and Rita Heskey at 10 Mile. Um, number five, uh, we're still talking about um, the pedestrian crossing and the pathway alignment for segment D. So um, we've had some interaction with ACHD and we have a pretty good approach, but, um, but we're still trying to distill all the messages we're getting from various stakeholders into what 
what's the best alignment moving west from 10 miles. So we can look at that. And number six would be the trailhead uh, that we've been talking about at 10 miles. So we can do some arm waving. And I hear that a truck will come to take us home. Or if this isn't a, this isn't a very long route, we might just ride, ride it back, depending on the weather. I, I was just going to bring So there's uh, just a question to throw out there. Um, one, would you like a trailer at the end where we could load bikes in and drive you back? We could just make it an out and back on the bikes. Um, it, the, the total route is, what, about three, four miles? Um, yeah, the, I think the squares are about one mile yep, sections. One so. mile sections. Yeah, but on um, a bike, that's not too. The. One thought I just had as we've been as we've been going through your project, uh, the presentation that I hadn't thought about before, if we did get picked up with the trailers at the end, we could drive back uh, and loop around through through McMillan and see the progress on the Lemp Larkwood pathway. I know we we don't yeah. have a number on this map for that because it's no. just off the map, but um, we could actually that, that one's also another pathway project in progress that we could just drive by on our way back to our vehicles. Um, or we can just do back on the bikes. Yeah, that's a good idea. Also on the map, number eight, I included just to show approximately where the pedestrian improvements for the Pine Avenue project are. Um, it'd be a little muddy and hard to get to, I think, for the field trip, and we'd, we're probably not backtracking, back but uh, just FYI for anybody who's not aware. So um, any input on, on logistics of the Pathways tour. Madam President, mm -hmm. um, how dark do we think it's going to be That's or close to yeah. being dark? We might be hitting, losing daylight by that time. Good question. It's a little earlier. Um, it, it, we're now in daylight saving signs. You can see it's just now getting dark and it's 7.30. But the, um, we're, we're hoping to start earlier. This is one of the logistical questions we have. So. The ribbon cutting is at 4 p.m. That's earlier than our typical meeting time. If somebody, and we're planning, and that ribbon cutting will be probably about, you know, 30 minutes. So um, sometime 4.30, 4.45, somewhere in there, we, we could be ready to get on our bikes and start the tour. The question is, can someone not be there until 5.30? Um, because well, we'd really like to start as soon as the ribbon cutting is done. I think it depends on if they can get their bikes and all that there, if they want to drag it to the, you know, the ribbon cutting and then have it there and then go to the other or if they're not going to, to the other, we are starting from the, we are bringing our bikes to the ribbon cutting site. Okay. We will start there. Although it might be possible to have your bike transported to the site if that would help facilitate for commission members, I would imagine. Um, can, can we uh, do this? Is, it, can, is there anyone who cannot be there for the ribbon cutting? Would like, need to postpone? Um, the, then the other question I was wanting to get logistically answered tonight is, is there anyone in need of a bike and helmet? that doesn't have one or have access to one. Really want Craig to ride the same bike he rode. Sorry. A year or two ago, when was that? <laughs> that was so fun. That was two years ago now, wasn't it? Sorry, I missed that one. Yes, I rode my daughter's bike. Those for of you who didn't see it. <laughs> it was it awesome. a nice basket out in front Dave with a little flowers bell on it. it. Mm, yes. Um, you a little dog in the basket. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm gonna try and skip that bike this year. Although Treg might bring his one with the big tires on it. You know. Sold it. <laughs> so although um, we are starting earlier, my only concern would be um, the prediction of weather. While I'm hoping it'll be 75 degrees and beautiful, by the time we get to the end, um, I do know even when we've had it later in April, it gets pretty chilly once the sun goes down. And so even when you're getting close to sunset, so that'd be my only um, so here's what I would propose. I propose that we, uh, we we start at the site with the ribbon cutting at 4:30. 
as immediately afterwards, we get on the bikes, do the tour in the order shown here. Um, at the end of that route, which should be at the, the Maverick near 10 Mile in, in Eustick, you know, we'll have a, a trailer available to load our bikes in. We'll drive back around on McMillan. We'll see the, uh, um, uh, the, the Lamp Larkwood pathway segment under construction. We won't be able to, to drive by number eight because of the roadway construction that is active, but we can, we'll be talking about that um, as, as a project also, and we'll just drive, you know, loop around back down Locust Grove and uh, back to our vehicles near the, at the ribbon cutting site. And I imagine we can circulate an agenda or a rough agenda. I don't know if that is customary for the Pathways Tour or? Uh, the agenda you know, is very simple. It, it simply says the, the tour and then the, the minutes will we'll talk about the sites that we visited okay. um, and what we talked about. Thanks. A little on the spot training. <laughs> okay. Do we have anything? I think we're good. Thank you very much. I like seeing um, a path prior to. I don't know that we usually get to see where we're going. <laughs> or maybe we do, and I just don't remember. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, with that, we are on staff reports. Uh, we have mentioned already again, but just to mention again, the uh, ribbon cutting tomorrow for the heroes. Park Art. Um, we're excited about that. We're excited that we have a lot of the local heroes coming and participating. Uh, we're getting the word out to the neighborhoods. We hope you can participate as well. Um, we will be having uh, upcoming uh, uh, ceremonies for the, uh, our next one will be the H2 pathway. Um, and that will be, and, and just to reiterate that meeting is a week early uh, from, from normal so that we can coincide with the mayor's availability. Um, so that'll be the first week in, in April. And then in May, we'll have the uh, ribbon cuttings for the, the Kleiner Memorial Plaza that we talked about tonight. And then at the end of May on the 25th is the op grand opening for Hillsdale Park. And uh, uh, the media uh, was just given tours of the YMCA uh, yesterday, I think you may, might see some new stories uh, coming out over the, the next week. So uh, we're excited to see that opening, and uh, I'll stand for any questions. Questions? You're off the hook. Yeah, the, the big one for me is the um, South Meridian Regional Parks under construction. Um, oh. And we've been doing a lot of work on the playground design and climbing wall map and splash pad and sand and water play and and um, trying to balance design with budget available availability and we'll come back in um, in May and show you what we've been up to and and um, ask for feedback so pretty exciting can't wait okay. and president Mike, um, how popular is the Story Bark Park? Pretty popular? <laughs> Good, great, great question. Um, it is the busiest two acres that we have, bar none. It is, it, it's packed all the time. I mean, it's amazing. So we have the grass fenced off still until it comes out of dormancy so it just doesn't get ground down to dirt. And so it's kind of compressed the uh, available space a little bit more. So it looks even busier when you go by, but it is, there's, there's 20 cars at any time of day out in front of the, yeah. And, and I haven't been by on the weekends. I bet it's double that easy. On a nice weekend, maybe 50 cars. So follow-up question, Madam President. <laughs> Have you considered adding more dog park spaces, other existing parks, or incorporating a dog park area to our newer parks? Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, South Meridian, um, part of our uh, part of our budget balancing um, that we did, we we had a an off leash area that was fenced with um, you know artificial surfacing and something not quite as robust as Story Bark Park, but along those lines. 
and that was um, that was taken out of phase one at this time. But one of the um, amenities that we want to put back as soon as we can is that off leash area because they are super popular. It's really not not for dogs as, as it is as much for people. The people love it. I mean, it's a social event. It's great. Oh yeah, yeah. We're, we'll we'll get one in South Meridian for sure. And then we'll have to get one in North Meridian. So that's central, right? <laughs> we have another big park coming up. Yeah, there, so. that other. I'll that other big one. Park down by the river. Have a yeah. dog area. That'd be good. Good question. All right. Okay. Um, Madam Mayor, members of the commission. What's that? So um, the first thing I wanted to share is with the Meridian uh, Main Street Market. I shared last time about the new direction and the new uh, name, uh, but I wanted to share with you the new logo that we de we've developed over the course of the last month or so. And so we have, this is gonna be our, our main logo. It's kind of a play on like a Google pin. Um, so it's gonna be, and, and I think I talked about the fact that we want it to be on Main Street um, in the future and so, um, it's kind of a kind of a play on you know both a, a carrot there, but it's also a pin where it's on Main Street, and so we're, we were pretty happy about the whole process. It took us several different you know iterations of going back and forth with our graphic designer and and getting input from the mayor and uh, folks around City Hall, but we're really happy with this uh, with this uh, layout. You know, normally vertical logos aren't as desirable just because of the way that they fit on. Um, on like application forms and things like that. But for this event particularly, we're really happy with this because it fits really well on a sandwich board. It fits really well on uh, downtown banners. Um, and so we also have a version that is a horizontal logo. And so if, Steve, if you wouldn't mind pulling up the next one. So we have a horizontal logo also that could, uh, depending on the space that we're using it in, we can use that. And then the third one, if you don't, if you don't mind, Steve, um, we are able to, uh, we've got this carrot icon that's kind of pulled out and it's, you know, we did the same thing with uh, the Meridian Home Court where we have, you know, a couple different versions of the regular logo and then we have just this icon that just the icon itself, you're not gonna necessarily, you know, just looking at this right now, you don't necessarily know what it is, but once we build up that brand recognition with Main Street Market, there are, a ton of possibilities with just this icon, like little scavenger hunts that you could do for kids, or you could make this into a plushie and and sell it, and, you know, and have those available at, your, at the farmers market. There's just there's so many different opportunities when you have a little, um, you know, just a, a graphic that is identifiable with your event. Uh, so into the future, we, I really like the idea of this, you know, being the you know the icon for the the market. So I just wanted to share with you the the work that's gone on for the past. Um, month to get to this final final product and so you're going to see this plastered everywhere hopefully in the next couple months uh, as we prepare for the farmers market to begin at the end of june um, other items uh, we have concessions contracts that have all been awarded for our uh, parks and so kleiner park story park bear creek park and tully park all have uh, vendors that have been approved we're working on those concessions contracts right now uh, one thing that I hate delivering bad news, but you know, it's, this is kind of a, was a significant thing for us this week that uh, our spring break day camp has always been super popular, and we unfortunately had to cancel it this year because the just the the market for uh, for staff people is so uh, so competitive right now. We were just un we were unable to get anybody to even apply for the position. We we got a couple people, but. Um, it was just, it's such a competitive market out there for uh, employment that uh, we had to cancel our spring break day camp this, this year because we weren't able to, you know, to put forth a good enough uh, staff. So that was kind of a bummer. Uh, we, had, we, had, we, had, we had it filled up with 40 kids already. And we, Jake spent the majority of uh, the early part of this week calling back parents and talking to them and, and issuing refunds. And so I hate delivering bad news, but that was kind of a big deal for us earlier this week. Um, on the events front, the movie night schedule is online now. 
And so feel free to go on to the Movie Night website and check that out. I know that I'm going to be uh, going through it with my kids and marking dates on our calendars pretty soon here. So that's ready to go. Um, spring softball deadline is, this, is coming this Friday. This is kind of a testament to, you know, we've, we've been, you know, yelling it from the mountaintops for years now about how busy we are with softball. But, and, and Tyler's done a really great job of making sure his teams know that, if you wait till the deadline, you're not going to get in because it's going to fill up. And so here we are Wednesday, two days before the deadline. We max out at 100 teams, and we have eight spots left. We've got 92 teams registered right now. We've still got two days. And traditionally speaking, in years past, 50% of the teams come in Thursday and Friday before the deadline. Everybody waits till the deadline. But here we are on Wednesday. We've got 92 teams registered, and I think everybody is dreading Friday because it's going to be a whole lot of bad news uh, given out to, to people. And so we're expecting a pretty long waiting list for, uh, for the spring softball league. And then finally, uh, the big thing at home court is we've been discussing these Bay 5 uh, concepts. We've been going back and forth with our architect. And we, uh, we've discussed it here. And next week, uh, Garrett and our architect, uh, Dana Kaufman, will be presenting to council to discuss the most recent renovation, uh, the most recent concept. We've kind of done some little tweaks with the counter and with uh, the stair and just, uh, it's, it's mostly what, you've, what you saw the last time when Garrett was here last month. Uh, but we're really excited to get council's input and to potentially move forward with uh, the first phase of that um, in the summertime. So that's all I had. Madam Any President? questions? I have a question. So for the Main Street Market, um, by the way, I've seen all the advertisements saying, you know, we want you. So I think that's amazing that Great. the message is really getting out there, which is fabulous. Have you heard anything about how uh, well it's been received in the community and whether or not they're starting to get people who want to be a part of the Main Street Market? Have you had any feedback? Um, I have not really... I have not gotten any feedback, but I have also, you know, we contracted out, and so the, our contractors are really the ones on the front lines. Um, I can, what I can say is that I'm an administrator of the Main Street Market Facebook page, and so every time they get, a, they get messaged, I get a notification on my phone, and I've seen several um, already, um, and, and it's only been a couple of weeks since they took ownership of the Facebook page and redid the name and redid the cover photo. And so um, there, there's definitely interest out there. And, and so I, I think, I'm, I'm hoping that we're you know, getting past the, the perception that it was a kid's event. Um, it's, it's, it's tough to know. It's, it's really early because they, they're just now getting the application out. Uh, I mean, it's, the application has come out within the last week for people to sign up. So it's, time will tell at this point. Madam President, mm -hmm. um, to answer your question, I met with the event coordinators a couple weeks ago, and uh, they have some very strong leads. They've already, uh, I don't know if officially been contributed, but have some commitments of some great uh, produce um, booths, and so they're, they're going after some, uh, some uh, multiple booths, so they're doing a great job. They, they want to keep it away from turning into a flea market, you know, type. Um, but they're, they're well underway. They're doing a great job. They're super animated, very excited. They, they really want to make this big, so. So out of curiosity on the um, vendor contracts that you're talking about, so is, is there a huge increase in, or a significant one from year to year, or do you usually get pretty competitive bidding on that? An, an increase in the For fee? the vendor, yeah. Um, you know, at, so at Kleiner Park and Settlers Park, we bid it out based on um, the, the, what they pay us as a percentage of gross sales. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, honestly, the, the amount that a vendor makes from year to year, it's been really volatile um, over the last few years. I mean, it has everything to do with, you know, the amount of heat and the amount of mm -hmm. uh, smoke in the air that keeps people away from the park. Um, it also has a lot to do with what's going on at that park. Um, you know, I think we saw one year where our movie night attendance 
was had dipped because uh, because we had a big influx of teenagers that would come and 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 not as many people came to and we saw a dip in the in the sales at Settlers Park, but oftentimes it's it you, you can't it's it's really hard to predict to, to predict what it's going to be and so. You know, at Settlers Park and Kleiner Park, we've been in the you know ten to ten to fifteen percent range of what we receive back, and then at uh, at Tully Park, Tully Park has traditionally gotten not much interest, um, but this year this year was different. Was the best year we've ever had for uh, the amount of in, uh, the amount of uh, bids we received back for the concessions contracts by far. Uh, Tolly Park, I haven't received more than one bid for three or four years, probably. Huh. And so um, this one was much more competitive, and the guy who won the bid is going to be paying us like $1,400 more than the lady paid us last year. And so it was a much more competitive process, and we had you know three bids for Story Park, and Bear Creek Park only got one bid, which is, it's a, it's a much slower park, typically. Mm -hmm. So that's not that wasn't uncommon, but it was you know. And at Kleiner Park, we had four four bids that were all really you know really responsive bids. Any one of them would have done a, a great job, I think. And that's just around the concessions, correct? Right. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, Thank at, you. I was yeah. just curious. Sure. Just because of the how you guys were having a hard time staffing for um, for the spring break. Yeah, those are yeah. all, con I mean, all those are contracted out, and so those mm -hmm. vendors provide their own staff. Awesome. Okay. Madam President. Yeah. Colin, thank you for your update. Um, I'm excited to see this new logo come out. That looks great. My initial concern is that it's a carrot, uh -huh. and people are going to arrive looking for produce, and there won't be any. Um, in years past, people would arrive ready to do their weekly grocery shopping, and we're disappointed to find, like, one produce vendor so I would just that's just my main concern yeah and that's been a focus uh, as we've been as we've been planning it is that you know we need to have those staple vendors it's uh, if, if you've it sounds like you've been to the farmers market that we've had and it, it has happened where produce vendors have run out of product and so you could show up near the end of the market and you could literally not have the ability to buy produce which is you know, death for a farmer's market, right? And so they're really looking at bringing in more uh, produce vendors. That's that's a real focus for them this year. That was, you know, of course that was a concern when we ended up deciding to stick on Saturday mornings because we're competing with all the other uh, farmer's markets. But, uh, you know, like I talked about last month, I think we decided that for the, you know, long term, we want to be on Saturday mornings because that's, you know, that's the best time for a farmer's market. And we think that uh, we think that we have enough local produce vendors to be able to, and because now that it's opened up to not just youth vendors, and there's some, some of those produce vendors out there that maybe thought that it was a youth event. And so we're really hoping to bring in more of those vendors this year. What about the, um, our community garden, how they, tend to have a lot of surplus where they donate. Is, has that ever been considered to um, be part of the farmer's market? That's an interesting idea. Um, I mean, part of their charter is to, is, is to donate that food and, and not sell it. And so I, I would be open to I, that idea. I'm not sure, yeah, I'm not sure what they would do with the, I, I think that needs some vetting, but it's a good idea. We could recycle back into their maintenance. Oh, just an idea. Madam President. President. Mm -hmm. I used to have a question about the YMCA home court design. You uh -huh. said it will be moving forward in June or July. So was the funding already approved for the second floor version, or is this a single floor so, design? Um, so if you at the, at the meeting last month, we came back with the, the updated plan where um, we are going away from the classroom designs. And so, uh, because we just felt, well, number one, the price came back really higher than what we thought it was going to be. And so to get the, to get the two floors, we were looking at over $3 million. And we felt like, you know, if we were going to spend that much money, that 
you know, we're putting those classrooms in a space that it doesn't, it doesn't fit the, the theme of that facility. And if we were gonna spend that much money, what we'd really prefer is to have a separate community center type of facility that's for that specifically. And so we brought back that, the other design where it makes that fifth bay into more of a, like an open, co open gym court with pickleball courts. It's, it's basically another sports court, but it functions, it's, it's got multi-purpose flooring instead of the hardwood, and it functions more as an open gym type of uh, layout where, you know, that, it, and it works really well where you can have, you know, everybody, instead of having our open gym times clear at the end of the, at, at the far end of the facility, um, because that's the only spot that we can, you know, section off and control entrance and exiting. Um, you can use Bay 5 for that space, and everybody that comes to Open Gym has to walk right past our front counter now, and we have the ability to kind of section that area off. It was gonna, it's gonna function really well for that purpose, and, and thus free up the, the main courts for reservations, because that's the main source of revenue for the facility, and if we can open up those, those hardwood floors for people to reserve at $45 an hour, then that's gonna, that's, you know, instead of having open gym where people are paying, you know, $2, $3 to get in, it's going to really help uh, generate some more revenue to offset the costs of the facility. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I was going to go back to the market. Um, Steve, sure. is Julie still doing the community garden? Yes, she was here last month. She gave her update, uh, which I know you time. couldn't make, but yeah, we, uh, she, she is there. I know she's talked about quitting for like five Wizard years. Wizard her about that. Um, she tried. She's working on succession plan. <laughs> yeah, part of it, they give a lot of food to the food bank, so I, I know that's very important to them. A couple of years ago, I did it out there, and it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, so I don't know if they'd really want to sell it, um, you know, just because of the amount of food they're able to give to the food bank. So, but it's worth a try. Maybe they can split it. But I know it goes to a really good cause, helping the food bank. Madam President and Colin, I apologize. I wasn't here last month, so clearly I missed Oh, that I'm up. sorry. But now that we're streaming, does that mean it's recorded online? I was going to let you know. It, okay. if, if, if you want to watch that presentation, it's, it's available on YouTube. Thank so you. is the community garden presentation, if you're interested in that one. <laughs> Thanks. You can see the layout. And Madam, <laughs> Madam President, and with, you know, on your comment, Craig, uh, with the farmer's market, I, I, I agree. My first thought is that, you know, they take a lot of pride in being able to donate that. And so I would be, you know, my first instinct was to say, let's see what we get for produce vendors, for, you know, the real produce vendors. And then if, we, or if we're feeling like we're short, then maybe approach the community garden at that point to kind of supplement um, what we already have. But if we if we end up with enough produce vendors to fill the need, then you know I don't think there's any. I don't if if they if they can you know can handle it, then I don't think there's any need to you know oversaturate it at that point. And because then at that point, if you bring in the community garden, then you're just you're dipping into the revenue of those vendors. And so and those are the vendors that we want to be coming back year after year. Is Shri involved? Is she one of them that is doing the farmer or the Shri market? Shri Eveland? Yeah. Yeah, Shri Eveland with Eventageous Idaho and Brittany Price with Indigo Idaho. They each have separate uh, event businesses, but they are teaming um, on the farmer's market. They're, they put in a joint uh, proposal, and their, their proposal was the one that was selected and we have our contract with them that's going to be on council next week but yes she is the half of the team yeah, i talked to her and i've been trying to help give her ideas and push her out in front of different groups and i have some other ideas for her. great Anything else? Okay. um i guess then i need i think there are no more comments then i need a motion to adjourn Madam president I'd like to make a motion that we adjourn tonight's meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> we are adjourned.